So Ray is just like, look backwards, last 500 years of history, every time, every time you've gotten to this point where you're gliding, uh, it, it always ends with either economic war or actual hot weaponry war. And yeah. you need this level of trauma so that people will finally go, fine, uh, everything that I owed, I'm, I'm just going to let go of it, whatever. It is what it is. I just want peace. And so you get this complete upending of everything. We reset, we go back to zero, but we do it in the most grueling, brutal, sacrificial way possible. I mean, and, and, and I hear this a lot from people like, ah, oh, this all rebalanced in a hundred years. Sure, but that is cold comfort to millennials who ha could never buy a house, right? Like, so, yes, but this is where the fourth turning comes to me, right? I think we are at economic warfare. Everybody needs an enemy. So we've decided that China, Russian, whoever we want to be our enemy is our enemy. So we are economic warfare for the share of the pie. But the world is not, it's not actually a fixed pie. There's an abundance. And that abundance is the other economic warfare, which is technology. Right? That's happening at a massive scale. And it's going into space. It's going everywhere. So we've got physical kind of warfare, economic warfare over technology which is what Taiwan is all about. You know, they own the secret code, which is the ability to produce um, computer chips uh, in ways that nobody else can replicate. So there's that. And then we are at war with each other as the population is split and wants to blame each other for what has happened when in fact it was actually the baby boomers that actually caused the problem in the first place. The people caused the problems of the people in fairness so, it was the greatest generation that had all the sex that gave birth right. to the baby boomers that created the problem and this is where it gets tricky because god bless the greatest generation for fighting the wars etc cetera, etc cetera. okay before we keep going down that road because i i want to keep this all in the construct of your um everything code because th this was very enlightening Okay, so you just walked us through uh, that first part about why we're going to keep having these financial crises, and the only way out of that uh, is to print money, basically. Uh, okay, next section. And the only way, huh, here we go, and the only way of solving this uh, is putting it on the central bank balance sheet because there's not enough GDP to pay the interest. This is what you were just talking about. So if you think about GDP growth, let's call it 2%, and let's assume that interest rates are 2%, which is roughly where they've been since 2008. So if the government is 100% GDP in debt and GDP grows at 2%, but interest payments are also at 2%, that's all of GDP growth just to pay the interest on the US government debt. But the private sector, excluding the financial sector, so households and corporations, are another 120% of GDP in debt. Uh, well, that will give you negative growth every year of 2% and it just com compounds. So what happens is those interest payments go to the Fed balance sheet and they monetize it. Again, this is what we were just talking about. So then the private sector is not competing with the government and that was provable across all major economies. It's like they all decided that they're, they're too far in debt and the only way to solve this is quantitative easing. And then I started thinking, well, if I know this to be true, and I know that the central bank balance sheets are 97% correlated with the asset prices, well, all I need to do is use forward-looking indicators to predict the central bank balance sheets and or interest payments. Dude, talk to me about this 97% correlated with assets. That, that seems like having a crystal ball. So it doesn't it actually reflect today. So you could basically, as I explained before, the thing that's actually driving the S&P 500 is the Fed balance sheet. It's not companies getting more When you more say valuable. driving, you mean driving the price. Correct. So it's an optical illusion. It's a money illusion. So the price you... simply rises to meet the level of inflation caused by printing money. Correct. You're readjusting the price. So that is what's going on. And so then when you understand that, and it's 97%, you understand that nothing matters apart from this liquidity, which is what I've been trying to tell people, is sorry, all your economic models are wrong. Yes, you need to forecast the business cycle to know where you are in the probability of printing money cycle, but that's all that matters. And it drives assets. 
And that's why people right now are getting very angry because the stock market's going up and they're like, yeah, but don't you know there's a recession? Yeah, I know that the answer to a recession is more cowbell, printing of more money. Which See, is why this is explains where, people. Th this, this is what I'm talking about with as people become aware of these issues, as you zoom out and you see the gigantic crater, you begin to realize, oh, we're in a recession. That means they're going to print money. So in a recession, prices are going up and people are like, yeah, I know where this goes. So that's crazy. And that it, it'll be very interesting to see what the knock on effects are of the um, everybody becoming aware of these patterns. And I've heard you say that uh, it's almost always the path of most pain is the the path that ends up actually happening. And so as we begin to predict, oh, this is what's going to happen. The fact that we can predict will have some very sort of painful uh, consequences. The important point being here is I know what drives liquidity. It's driven by the business cycle. And there are certain cycles that are forward looking. The Chinese credit cycle happens to lead by about 18 months or two years. For people that don't know what the business cycle is, can you give a quick primer? The business cycle is the ebb and flow in economic activity that occurs. And that's a boom and bust, a recession expansion. Is it caused um, by interest rates? We don't really know what causes the business cycle. It's caused partly by interest rates. It's caused by excess production, excess inventories, too limited inventories. Too... There's many things that can can drive a business cycle, but it's observable and has been observable for millennia. And one of the things we do is when the business cycle is too hot and inflation starts rising, central banks tend to rise, raise interest rates. That tends to bring down economic activity. I think even without a central bank, interest rates would rise naturally because um, I think the free market can set interest rates without a central bank. And then the economy slows down again and we see this, this endless cycle. So what I think my hypothesis is, is that, okay, this is very observable. I think it's going to last, this relationship between assets and the central bank balance sheet because of the mechanism of debasement of currency. And I can forecast out what the business cycle looks like and I also know the amount of interest payments that need to be made because they, they happened three and a half years ago. And I can see how far the balance sheet is going to expand. So the balance sheet right now is what, six and a half trillion dollars. And it looks like it will get oh, seven trillion dollars or so. And it looks like it will get to 12 to 14 trillion dollars by the end of 2025. So that puts and there's a number of other ways I've proven this out in this whole thing. And I'll send you the whole piece uh, myself i've not really gone public with all all of the whole thing of how it works but in the end that puts asset prices massively higher than here hugely higher um so we're looking at more than a doubling of the nasdaq from here Ooh. we're looking at another gigantic crypto run that's into 2025 so we're seeing huge moves that just come from the debasement and I've gone through in the Everything Code article that I wrote for Global Macro Investor, which is my kind of premium research service. In that, I've gone through various ways of proving this all out. Um, so that's what I think I can do. But your observation, I think, is really important. Okay, when people, I mean, I've sent this to quite a few people, and obviously the subscribers of Global Macro Investor are kind of a lot of the world's most famous hedge fund managers, um, asset managers. And I, I think it it really shocked people and resonated with people. They're like, oh my God, everything makes sense now. And so once you see it, it all makes sense. Um, now, as it becomes more public as a thesis, and Mike Howell at Cross Border Capital has been talking some elements of this, liquidity. You can see liquidity becoming part of the, the conversation on financial Twitter and stuff now. What I think we'll probably do is create boom-bust cycles. Again, you can't have the bus cycle going below the level of central bank liquidity because optically they make it rise. This is what people don't yet understand. But of course, the stock market should go down 90%. Can't happen. Literally can't happen because of the debasement. It's a money illusion. But what I think we'll do is see, hey, off we go to the races. That's what happened in 2018. 2018, uh, sorry, 19 
uh, early 20, we actually diverged from the central bank balance sheet uh, massively because people starting to figure out this game, which is the moment the Fed stop the tightening cycle, markets take off because mm-hmm. they know that the probability of more cowbell, more, more central bank printing of money, more interest rate cuts is coming. And so therefore we get boom bust cycles. So the boom times are too big and then you get a bust. And we people know that from crypto as well. The long-term trend remains intact, but we, we keep getting these huge booms, collapse, boom, collapse, but the trend is still up. I think that's what we'll see. We'll be more like the crypto cycle, which is pretty much what we've just seen as well. We had a big collapse last year, and now we're straight back into the boom as we're starting to forecast this. All right. So uh, let me see if I'm tracking all of this. Sorry, there is a lot in this. <laughs> no, man, there there is. But the the more I go over this stuff, the more times I encounter it, the more I'm I'm really beginning to piece together what's happening. Uh, it it is though leading me to a level of distress. It does not make me calm, and it's leading me to a level of distress. While I agree with you, when you start looking beyond the next twenty years, it it evens back out, and and we hopefully get the exponential age, and and that works but, out. But like, I I think there's such a, a period of tumult that no. Yes. Okay. Let's get down to an individual level. Let's not get to societal level. I can solve. I can unfuck your future which is the series that we ran on Real Vision, by simply offering you the right asset. You get caught in this trap. If you own crypto or technology, you will outperform this entire thing. Now, if you're not wealthy enough to buy, you know, set up a brokerage account doing that because it's complicated for you, you can do it with crypto for no money. And you'll participate not only in the, in the trend of debasement, so you're not getting left behind, because if you're just getting an income and you're not buying any assets, you're truly going getting behind. So your 401k may look like the S&P 500. That's not making you any richer. Just buy technology or buy crypto. And those are the only two assets that outperform the central bank balance sheet. So there's your solve at a personal level. All right. So societal before, level. Before we can get into that, I think we have to track. We have to track why. Uh, let's recap why you get this uh, the stock market rising and falling with the printing of money. So you've covered that very well, but just by a quick recap, uh, as you pump money into the system, then the cost of the assets are necessarily going to rise because they are a scarce asset. And as there's more money available, those prices are going to rise. They're going to rise in proportion. And so you can just watch them rise and lower together. Uh, now, the reason why, and I'll say Bitcoin, maybe instead of crypto, just because there's a lot of things going on in crypto that get a little dodgy. And so I'll focus, uh, while this, I don't think Bitcoin, I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist by any stretch of the imagination, but, no, but it's, Bitcoin's it's a clear way of describing this. Correct. So when you look at Bitcoin, the reason, and you were the first person to show me a chart that basically shows the, the price of Bitcoin goes up as money is pumped into the system. And it, it's interesting that it tracks in the same way that the stock market tracks, but for the exact opposite reason. So the reason that the price of Bitcoin is going, going to go up is people are like, yo, I need to be somewhere where I can't have my value debased through the creation of additional, right? So printing of money. So when you print money, buying power goes down because prices rise in commensurate with the amount of money going into the system. So you feel like you're getting richer, but you're not. It's an illusion. God, I love that you use that word. Okay, so people then pour into Bitcoin because they're like, there will only ever be 22 million. That That's just it. And so since I know that that's it, that it is a finite cap, it will never go more, then you can't debase it through the printing of additional Bitcoin. Okay, so people flood into that and you see it rise. And so that was the first time, because I was like, people were speculating, what is Bitcoin? What does its price respond to? And once you pointed out it responds to the M2 global money supply, I was like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. So um, walk people through then how to play that game well. Why technology? That we haven't addressed yet. So why technology? Um, And how do you do Bitcoin well? Is it a buy and hold? Uh, Are you trading? What does that look like? So if... With Bitcoin, I treat it as an asset that is going to protect my long-term wealth. 
And that sounds crazy when it goes up and down like it does, right? And you've just gone through that full first cycle and you're like, oh, 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 oh. But what you'll find is the low is higher than the last time it, it hit the bottom. And then the next low will be higher and each high is higher. Oh, it's in an uptrend. So I just don't need to sweat about the ups and downs. What I should do is just accumulate every time it's in a down cycle. Why? Well, because the down cycle is signifying that economic contraction is happening and that the world is slowing down and money is being taken out of the system, quantitative tightening, which is the opposite process, and assets fall. And interest rates are going up, so your disposable income is going down because your wages aren't going up enough and interest rates have gone up more. So it's at that point you know the outcome is if economic activity is going to slow down, the next year, in, ne in a year's time, they're going to be printing money or cutting rates because it's very cyclical for the phenomena of this rolling of this debt. So therefore, you should be buying more at these points because then you've got the next upside cycle to come, which is what I've always said is it's the cyclical trend within a secular trend. Okay, this guaranteed people do not know the difference. So secular trend is something long-term trend driven by a large explainable factor. Uh, Bitcoin is an answer to the financial system and over time, the number of users and people who become aware of its, um, of its superpower, the more people move across. That is a secular trend of, of, of adoption. That's really important. The cyclical trend, the cyclicality is the ebb and flow within it. So that's the boom bust of the economy. Not at a gigantic bust level, it's just a boom bust. Now, Bitcoin halving cycles correspond with all of this. Why? Is there some magic in that reduction of supply? Maybe. But Bitcoin came out exactly at the same time that all interest rates went to zero. They're all part of the same cycle. So every time we get into this economic cycle, it affects Bitcoin in the same way. But over the long run, the adoption, the secular cycle, means it outperforms everything. Because there's no secular adoption of, of the S&P 500. There's no secular adoption of General Electric. or you know, That stuff's not really happening. Yes, there's an ongoing purchasing by 401ks, but that's really it. So, so that big mega trend is the observable trend that people can participate in. And it is going to more than offset what is going on with the debasement of currency. And that's to do with Metcalfe's law and the exponential trend of the adoption of a technological network or a technology itself. Great. So that's why Bitcoin charts over time just keep doing this. It's because it's exponential. The S&P 500 doesn't do that because it's not exponential. But the NASDAQ does. Most technologies do. And the reason why the NASDAQ keeps outperforming the S&P and keeps outperforming value stocks and makes people so angry is because it's all about the adoption of new technology. If you think about what's been driving the NASDAQ recently, it's the adoption of AI. Obviously, that's the fastest adoption of any technology in history. Crypto was the fastest beforehand, but this has eclipsed it. It's gone from, in six months, from basically zero users to 100 million users in six months. We've never Can seen put, like it. I want to put an interpretation of what you just said forward and tell me if this is accurate, because I thought your punchline was going to be the reason that technology performs, outperforms the illusion of prices going up uh, is because it's an increase in productivity per capita. But what I hear you saying with Metcalf's law is it's actually outperforming because of what I will call, you're going to hate this word, but hype. That basically the people are pouring into it. They're so excited. No, oh my God. That's not what, that's not what Metcalf's law is. I know Metcalf's what Metcalf's law. law is, but I'm saying if if you really think about why Metcalf's law would drive value that exceeds the illusion, that is the only thing I can take away from that. Because if it isn't increasing productivity per capita, why would it otherwise outstrip? No, it is, and we'll come on to that in a sec. 
But Metcalf's law is the number of nodes on a network, i.e. number of users of crypto, yep. versus the number of applications in the interconnection. So the more we build out a Web3 world, the more that that's the multiplier as opposed to the people. Initially, it's the people who use it. So like Doge has no use case apart from memes, memetics, but it has a bunch of users. Um, Bitcoin has limited use, but a huge amount of users as well. But the use case is very, you know, is very clear, which is the, you know, the scarcity of the assets and the purity of the asset and the security of the network. Ethereum has lots of uses, DeFi, NFTs, all of this stuff, and a whole load of users. So the, the, this is what's driving these things. Why are we adopting the technology? That's the productivity equation. The financial system becomes more productive and safer and secure by using cryptocurrency rails. We become superpowers as humans by adopting AI robotics. We become more productive and ability to do stuff by adopting EV technology. We, you know, all of this stuff is actually driving productivity. Now, here's I, another. I, uh, so I need to push back on that. So I don't think it's it. The value created in Web3, speaking as somebody, is as in Web3 as a human can be. I've put just a gazillion of my own dollars into this. Uh, it's right now, it is all people betting that this is going to be the future versus it actually being the future right now. So that's why that's, I say- that, the, That's how you make money, my friend. The moment yeah, it word. is- I, I'm not The I'm moment not it casting, is, right, is the moment- the bet the investment the there are use cases so let me just let's just get out of the nft noise and everything else i'm having dinner with a friend of mine he used to run one of the largest the trading operations of one of the largest banks in australia and it's a big bank the equivalent of bank of america and um he's like yeah you know he's just retired and he's like yeah we, i've been heavily involved in crypto at the bank doing stuff i'm like what are you guys doing he goes we've issued five stable coins i'm like why why do you need the stable coins why you know what why not use tether or usdc or whatever he's like okay so th this is what people don't understand why crypto is so important for the financial system he said we're in australia we have a gigantic pension system our pension system buys a gigantic amount of us equities the us is about to you go to settlement so when you buy a share and you have to pay for it from t plus two or t plus three so that's trade date plus three days to pay for the bill to t plus one okay that seems fine foreign exchange transactions are t plus two they can't settle the us stocks that they buy so they either have to leave massive amounts of money with a broker that they dealt with who could go bust or use uses the money ineffectively, or they create a stable coin for instant settlement. So they can, so, and they built that, this one is on top of Ethereum. Okay, fine. But that is a multi hundred billion dollar use case for why crypto is very powerful for increasing productivity within the financial system alone. And there's many of these all over the place. So why is Tether such a big, useful stablecoin? You've basically fractionalized the US dollar and now a person in the Philippines who works in a rice field to receive a payment from his cousin who's living in New York City instantaneously without any cost in dollars, which is the currency that they all want. That's mind blowing. That's why the stablecoin system alone is so gigantic. So I don't agree with there is no productivity or killer app. The killer app of crypto so far has actually been stable coins. And that- Well, so I want to make sure what, what I'm saying is is very nuanced, but I, I don't think I'm being clear enough yet. So what I'm saying is that um, Metcalf's law, if the reason that tech has outperformed is because of Metcalf's law, which remember, I was surprised to hear you say, I didn't think that's what you were going to say. I thought you were going to say productivity, but you said Metcalf's law. If that's true, and I'm just trying to understand what the reality is, and you're saying, this is how you make money. I, hey, I'm with you. I'm just trying to understand what this is in without fancy 
uh, concepts, just like the the down home nitty gritty. So Metcalf's law is, as far as I can tell, that is the point at which it is hype. It's people getting excited. Now they may be hype for good reasons. Right. They may be hype because they're right about where productivity is coming from. But is well, then let me ask it this way: You're, for those just listening, he's shaking his head. Uh, is there a difference between Metcalf's law and productivity, or to you are they one and the same? No, they're two entirely different concepts. Metcalf's law is the value of a met network and how to value it. And the, and the value... With those are two very different statements. Is it the value of the network or is it how you value its future uh, utility? Every vote that goes into a market, i.e. every time price moves, is a vote about current expectations and future expectations. So it's difficult to pass out what that means. But I've provably shown that I can distill Metcalf's law pretty simply in cryptocurrency to two things. Number of active users. Okay, that makes sense. That's the nodes. Mm -hmm. And then the value of the economic activity. And all I did was the dollar value that gets exchanged every month or week. Those two numbers multiplied out gives this crazy, ridiculously large number. But that, when you put it on a graph, is exactly the same as price. And so it's remarkable because price is not in that equation. So Does the value of the law take in the, the math that you were just saying, the value of the transactions yeah, on the network? It's the, it's the, it's basically, no, Metcalf's law, nobody knows how to fully measure a Metcalf's law value system so you need to approximate it because it's quite a complex mathematical formula and you're dealing with imperfect worlds where you can't put it in but anyway that's nothing to do with the productivity people are flocking to the technology because it increases whether it's your productivity or solves other solutions for you you know there's, so i'm going to say that slightly differently and this is where i'm surprised it's very possible i'm missing something you were so much more thoughtful on this stuff than i am currently but this still what i'm about to say still <laughs> seems true to me and that is that uh metcalf's law is the is the observable response to when people believe something is going to be going to be Amazing. So take ETH. People believe that building on Ethereum is going to be the future. I'm one of them. I believe it to the core of my existence, but it hasn't yielded that yet. No, that's not right. Every mobile phone network is priced in Metcalf's law. All networks are priced at Metcalf's law. But, but why can't they be? I, think, I don't think it matters, Tom. I think you're getting caught in a in a thing that doesn't really matter. What matters to the bigger equation? The two things that matter with, with um, this whole thing is, does, does Bitcoin protect you from this issue of debasement, the mutualization of losses amongst everybody? Yes. Okay, fine. Nothing else matters there. Does it, could it be form part of what I call the exponential age of technologies, which could eventually increase productivity. Yes. Now, they're not mutually exclusive. There's no, you know, Metcalf's law is just a measurement of the value of a network. But this productivity idea is the big one. And the pro productivity idea is, if we can't change, we can't keep increasing the debt. Remember, the magic formula was population growth or productivity growth plus debt growth. We can't change the population. The debt growth has got too far. So we've got this one thing in the middle. It's the only thing that can change this entire equation. So what we can do is try and grow that. Okay, now let's step back and say, okay, what's happening to the world that's a really big change that happened that the central banks are looking like they're going to print money to do? And that's the green revolution. And it's being driven by Europe, but it's being driven elsewhere. So yes, climate change, yes, all of the benefits of doing this, but there is a magic outcome. So productivity, let's say, 
we use AI, we can do more stuff. And you and I have talked about this in the past, right? We can expand now human knowledge in ways we couldn't do before. And factory lines and agricultural machinery just basically created more productivity per human. Okay, fine. But the big equation in this is the inflation adjusted price of oil, which let's call that the, the kind of best benchmark for energy input costs, have been $40 in inflation adjusted terms for 70 years, 60 years. So we've got a fixed thing here, which is can we put more output per calorie or kilojoule of energy? That is what productivity is all about. So technology keeps rising, and that's great, keeps going. But all of these governments are focused on the other part of this equation, which is, can I lower the cost of energy? Because if you drop the cost of energy from 40 bucks per, per barrel of oil equivalent to 10, you 4x productivity. And there is your solution. And that is why they're pouring trillions of dollars into this. And we're seeing what's known as rights law, sorry, all these terms, which is the increase in output of a new technology has a commensurate measurable decrease in the cost. And we're seeing that with all of the green energy. So it's just getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Now, we can't scale it enough yet, but we know that there's nuclear, there's going to be part of this equation. There's a bunch of things. But over time, we will move away from that $40 fossil fuel anchor and move to $10. So think of the multiplier because technology is doing this and the cost is doing that. That is, that is what the productivity miracle that is coming. You can reboot your life, your health, even your career, anything you want. All you need is discipline. I can teach you the tactics that I learned while growing a billion dollar business that will allow you to see your goals through. Whether you want better health, stronger relationships, a more successful career, any of that is possible with the mindset and business programs in Impact Theory University. Join the thousands of students who have already accomplished amazing things. Tap now for a free trial and get started today. So help me understand why didn't the internet, which still to me feels like a productivity productivity miracle, why didn't that um, change all of this? Why why isn't it already the lily pad that you believe the exponential age is going to be? So I think because it replaced jobs. You don't think, think AI is going to replace jobs? Yes, I do. But I think the, the, the productivity trend is a function of demographics as well. And I don't fully understand why the internet didn't do that, but it also hold out manufacturing jobs. So there was a, a balance on aggregate what happened within the economy. So I'm thinking it's on aggregate it wasn't enough to offset these mega trends that we talked about that were driven by the demographics and the debt and and the globalization. So I'm thinking it's that. And so we have to have an accelerant because technology growth is not enough to offset demographic issues. And that's what I'm thinking it probably is. You know, we did create, I mean, trend rate of GDP has been falling. So whatever we've done with technology in the same number of people, roughly, we don't seem to have pushed up GDP growth. Let me ask a really ugly question. Hearing everything you're saying, it seems like, I know it's not, but I, I, I'm I, not yet sure why not. Why isn't the baby boom generation dying off and population contracting uh, deflationary in a good way? It is. Well then, <laughs> tell me more. Uh, I thought, so population collapse, it, my gut instinct is that it's terrible. Um, what's the benefit? The benefit is more stuff for you and I. Our per capita GDP goes up and it's observable in Japan. It's observable in Switzerland. So GDP per capita goes up. 
and that helps offset some of these. Now, the problem is, is per capita is a nice economic term, but right now it accrues to mega giant companies. So it's a way of redistributing that capital amongst the people, which is important, which is why, you know, I believe in things like Web3 technologies because it allows more people to participate in ways that they couldn't participate in before. Because if not, Google captured it all and Apple captured it all. So I think there's a probability that as the population shrinks, it, it creates a slowdown in growth because of the magic formula. But if you can increase that productivity element, then we will be richer per capita. Now, there's a government problem of how you distribute that. You know, you need to tax corporations more than they're being taxed. These giant corporations that pay no tax. Most people with an average business pays tax up to here. But Google pays, I don't know what their marginal rate tax is, 5%. That's wrong. And Amazon, because they're benefiting from the holding out of the American worker in the technology boom. And the people aren't, which is what's making people angry. Now, they're not doing it because they're bad people. It's just the set of cards they've been dealt with. It's been incredibly attractive to be, you know, a super large company, particularly one with a growing industry like technology. So, okay, so... I think net net, you can orchestrate it. That per capita GDP rises. But you have to think about that issue. Of does it accrue to the people or not? What happens if the population is declining, but productivity doesn't go up? Well, then we just go, trend rate of economic growth just keeps falling. And so the reason that that I'm, so I always assumed that the reason that population falling was a problem is there are fewer people that want to buy your goods and th that's why it, it hollows out the sort of uh, GDP core economic engine. But as I think about it, it would also, um, it's interesting, it's going to create a weird sort of uh, feedback collision, but it would increase wages. So if there are fewer people for companies to hire, uh, that's great for the employees' wages. But if there are fewer companies because there's no one to sell anything to, no, bad, no problem. Bad assumption. And this is, I can see the, the IMF got into this whole mess as well. And everyone now says inflation's going up as population dies out. Bad assumption because technology is in the business of replacing costs. And they will just find ways to employ less people. I mean, again, you and I have talked about this. Is like, 10 years ago, video editors and sound people, et cetera, were really expensive. But now we can do it on AI. So people have to do two or three jobs. They hustle. It's, it's changed the structure of stuff. And technology will just keep looking for the cost and replacing it. It's, it's, it's relentless. It's the biggest observable trend is once you digitize things, the cost goes to zero in everything it touches. Inflation is a generalized rise in prices. The price of eggs goes up, the price of gas in your car goes up, you know, the cost of employing people goes up, etc. Debasement of currency is this really weird little trick. Things of fixed supply or relatively fixed supply go up immensely optically because the price of the currency has fallen. Things of variable supply, like wages, corporate earnings, don't. And they don't go as much. So what you find is, after quantitative easing, what happens? Stock market goes up, gold goes up, cryptocurrencies go up, housing goes up, fine art goes up, all of that stuff. Assets. So assets are a way of storing wealth. That's what an asset really is. So in relative terms, They've held their price and the currency's fallen, makes them look like they've gone up in price. Mm. It's not. And this is what everybody gets confused with. This is why price earnings ratios have gone up so much because the earnings doesn't move as much as the price of the asset because it's a small fraction of it. So PEs keep going up the more we debase currency. If you want to see another example, you look at charts of the Venezuelan stock market in Venezuelan bolivars and it goes straight up. If you put it in US dollars, it's actually down 99%. So 
So it doesn't create a generalized rise in prices. This is what everybody confused because they think it, they thought it was an increase in the money supply in a way that you and I could get it. We can go buy more stuff. It doesn't work that way. All right. So would inflation happen though, if you didn't have debasement? I am not a monetarist. I don't believe inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomena. Interesting. I think it is a supply demand phenomena above all things. Some people claim it's a supply and demand for money phenomena. I don't believe that because of the 1970s inflation is as provable as it possibly can be, was driven by demographics. The baby boomers all hit 30 at the same time, bought their first house, their first car, their first blah, 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 blah. And that what was caught, that's what caused the inflation of the 70s. We've never had inflation like that before or since. Because guess what? We've never had such a big cohort of 25 to 30 year olds all at the same time. So Wanting what you have is massive... things that have a limited supply. Correct. Or buy anything because they used to live with their parents. And before you know it, they're buying duplicate stuff because you live with your parents. There's one car or two cars, whatever it is, right? You leave, there's now another car. Mm. And you, you meet a girlfriend or a partner, there's another car. So you've now doubled the con. Oh, uh, and you bought a house. So that's a second house that didn't exist before. That's why demographics are deflationary and inflationary, depending where you are in the demographic cycle. Okay, this whole idea of demographics as destiny is really interesting. Here's a question that I've never thought of before. Would we run into a problem if you could? So one, I let's put a finger on uh, debasement. Debasement is the government creates money out of nowhere. And so they literally just make it up. So if we were back in the days of printing, you would just turn the printer on. That's why they call it printing money, though now it's just a database entry. But if we were back in the printer days, you would print more. Would we run into a problem if we couldn't create more money because more people are being born, the population is going up? If money, like I, I think about this sometimes with Bitcoin. The that's, very what thing a that makes that's what a depression is. A depression is when there's not enough money for the demands. Like literal money. So what happens is the opposite of the debasement. Assets get devalued and currency, which is the thing that's in scarce supply, but the money is the thing that everybody desperately needs. When that is extreme, that's a depression. What we're seeing now is the opposite. So we've got inflation, but they've reduced liquidity to try and cool the demand. And okay. people want a, a preferring to try and get hold of money as opposed to assets, and the price of assets has gone down. So they've actually done the, the opposite. Quantitative tightening is the opposite of quantitative easing. So theoretically, if quantitative easing causes assets to go up, then quantitative um, tightening should make asset prices go down because you're making currency scarcer. Simple. Okay, so one, I, I've asked this question before, but I forget the answer. How do they quantitatively tighten? How do they get money out of supply? Because they're not going around burning paper dollars. So how are they doing it? They're just buying it. So they're buying bonds from banks or other participants. Wouldn't that put money into the system? Because at that point, they're buying something. So sure, they sorry, they're, the they're, the sorry, they're selling off their bond inventory. So they're okay. doing the opposite, right? So um, they give people something, but they take the money and then they hold it. Correct. And so that uh, I wrote that down as you were talking about a depression. A depression really isn't that the money goes away. A depression is that the money is now locked in people's wallets, bank accounts, whatever. They still have it. They're just not moving it. Is that correct? And you can't get it for love or money. You just you want the money. And so the depression is is where all the assets fall in price. It, you know, it, it's that, it's, the, it's, the, it's, it's all supply and demand in certain ways. Yeah, it's all psychology. I mean, this is the, the utterly fascinating thing that I'm sure we'll keep looping back to. Okay, so money isn't moving during a depression. And so I was talking to Robert Breedlove about this, and I still have a nagging feeling as much as I don't, Right now, with my limited understanding, I don't like that money's being inflated. Right now, with my limited understanding, I absolutely love Bitcoin because I see how it's going to hold my wealth over time. 
But there is a part of me that keeps asking the question, am I actually mad at them using this cycle? Because if this game really is psychology and we get all of the innovation and everything that we get because of innovation and to get people to innovate, and I'm remembering now how Robert uh, swatted this down, but I'll be curious to hear your thoughts. So I keep, my default position is that people innovate because money is moving. So you make something and people don't think that their money will be worth more over time if they hold it. So it is not a good asset in that sense. They think it'll be flat. That's how I think most people think of it. I think inflation is sort of invisible. No, most people don't account for it until you get into a higher inflationary environment. And so they think of their money as being flat. In truth, their money is actually declining in buying power because of inflation, but they think of it as flat, or at least I always have. So I think of my money as flat. People think of their money as flat. So eh, if I want a Kit Kat bar today, I'm just going to give you money for it and I'm going to eat the Kit Kat. But if I think this is like the, the joke that people make about the guy that bought a pizza for you know 20 Bitcoin or whatever, it's like, bro, that's $67 million you know, or whatever at the height. And so what a fool you were. That is when your money is depreciating instead of inflating or deflating, excuse me, instead of inflating. So you've got this trick that happens psychologically when the banks put money into the system, you feel like your money is going to be worth the same tomorrow that it is today. And so you don't have a problem spending it. Does that seem crazy to you? No. So... It's all about this marginal propensity to consume or to save or whatever, and that's your expected future value of money. The reason there's not a lot of velocity of money in Bitcoin, there's a lot of hodlers, is that the general view is, well, I'm going to be better off if I just hold it. right? Which is why nobody's going to use Bitcoin as a transaction layer, apart from Lightning, because it's just the blockchain rails. But why would you? Because nobody wants to be the Bitcoin pizza guy. So you don't. So it's actually kind of deflationary in that respect. And all of this is a game. It's a game of who are the other competitors in this game? Who are the, the rules, as you would call them, right? Okay, we've got the central banks. They want to do one thing to us. We've got the asset prices, and they can do another thing based on whatever's going on there, you know, if you're investing in commodities or equities or whatever. And I need to navigate that to get to where I want to get to. And I have this base assumption that my cash is going to be flat. So I put 10 grand in a bank. I'm assuming my 10 grand is worth 10 grand. We know it's not, but in a one-year time horizon, we don't really care if it's worth 2% less because we, we don't notice that. So then... We're looking at the other levers and saying, okay, what is going to deliver what Tom wants, which is I want my money to, to offset debasement, not inflation, because crypto has done a terrible job of that, as has everything, including gold. I mean, virtually nothing offset this inflation we've just had. So that kind of took us all by surprise. But the debasement, well, I just... In, divide all of these assets by the Fed balance sheet. That's really interesting. The S&P kind of goes nowhere. It kind of, it's right at the bottom now since 2008. So as they started using the Fed balance sheet, debasing the currency, the stock market has just accounted for that. The Fed balance sheet has been doing that. The stock market's done that, but actually they've netted each other out. You haven't got any richer. Um, gold fails. You've actually got poorer versus the Fed balance sheet. So the big gold narrative Why? failed. I don't know, because probably because of crypto. So I people just had a less marginal propensity to use it. In a digital age, gold is not actually that useful. The NASDAQ did actually pretty well. We're still not back up to 2008 levels or 2007 levels, but it's been going up. Why? Technology. Technology is a secular trend. The S&P 500 does not have a secular trend behind it. So, and then when you put crypto, crypto is the only thing that's really outperformed because what you've got there is you've got technology 
and this kind of whole network adoption model. And it works really well for debasement of assets because it's scarce. Technology companies aren't scarce, really. You can just keep building them, but you can't do it here. So it, it works phenomenally well. So you're taking the bet that future Tom wants to not have screwed up, and therefore future Tom wants to choose the asset that he thinks best represents the set of risks that he sees that being played at the table in the game. And that risk to you is debasement of currency, which I think is probably the larger risk. Um, and therefore, Bitcoin or crypto is the best bet to take. But it depends what, what future you is, depending who, who's watching this and what they need. Because some people want to protect, some people want to grow, some people want to, yeah, there's, there's different motivations. But generally, it's protect what you've got so you can maintain your level of your who you are, because nobody wants to ratchet down the reality or their expectations of themselves. There's psychology again. So velocity of money, this is a very interesting concept. And I hope everybody takes me as you would take somebody who is learning something. Every time I get a new piece of this puzzle, it does feel like the emotional ups and downs are easier to deal with. I won't say that I feel that I'm better at predicting. And I do want to talk at some point before we go about looking forward to 18 months and what that looks like. But first I wanna contend with this idea of velocity of money. So the rate at which money moves seems to be the thing that the Fed is trying to influence because they understand the psychology. So roaring 20s, if I had to guess, high velocity of money. Uh, 1930s, I know because you said earlier that a depression is when the money stops moving. So depression, low velocity of money. I think it was Jerome Powell that said recently, I want to keep cranking up rates because it will slow the economy. Yes. And if I go too far and I break a bone, that's okay because I have tools that I know how to use to fix a broken bone, Which but I don't have tools. Facing to your currency. Exactly. So, but this goes back to the velocity of money. And so, okay, I'm, I'm put, putting this all in context of a guy who has a a, a meaningful, not a scary, but a meaningful part of my net worth in Bitcoin, because I believe in the narrative of it will hold value over space and time. There's an interesting note there to be made about did Bitcoin just inflate gold, which is an utterly fascinating thought. And that 50 years from now, will there still be gold and Bitcoin anyway? So I, I believe in Bitcoin. I believe in its ability to hold that. But I also have this feeling, especially now sitting in the soup of uh, all this madness has happened in crypto with fraud. Yes, it happens everywhere. Cool. But my punchline is that regulation, I'm always tempted by the libertarian notion of just like, don't tread on me, let me do my thing. But then I'm like, uh, humans, like they'll find the edges. There are psychopaths among us. Even if SBF didn't mean to be a, a just absolutely ruinous psychopath, like that's what ended up happening. And I can only imagine the the human agony expense of nine whatever billion dollars that ends up getting lost. Like, whoa, that just absolutely devastating. Okay, so sitting in that soup, I find myself going, I'm actually okay with a certain amount of government. I pay a lot of taxes. I do have a breaking point where I start to get really annoyed and feel like it's being overstepped and misused. Let me try to put all the context on the table here. But I don't feel like just, ah, no regulation is the right answer. We need some regulation to all of this to keep people from going crazy. But God, is it my ignorance that's telling me that the central banks may not be the worst thing ever? <laughs> oh, I know how people that know more than me are going to have a seizure. But I can't help but think, given that this is a game of psychology, given how easy it is to sort of nudge humans in a direction, that they could clamp down on their money, be too paranoid to spend it, and that it isn't necessarily a bad thing that we do have this tool to nudge it. Now, conspiracies, the bees from Jekyll Island, like I understand all of it. And so it's like, it's all sort of bad, but on balance, I come down on, I don't know, the system seems reasonably functional. How 
crazy does that sound from your far more knowledgeable perspective? So there's a few things first. Velocity of money is, as you say, but it's a demographic phenomenon. So velocity of money has been super low since 2000. So not influenced by the Fed? No. Interesting. Whoa, okay. Shocking. They you're you're smacking been, my worldview around. They have not been able to. Interesting. Because psychology. Who is hoarding money? Baby boomers. The same people who cause the inflation are causing the deflation or disinflationary trend. Because they're hoarding money because they're now 75 years old. And all you want to do is make sure you don't die destitute at 85 mm. or 90, right? Imagine if you're homeless at 85, right? So you are driven by one of the strongest psycho psychological factors you have is, I cannot get any worse than I am today, right? So you're a hard stop, so you won't spend. So the baby booms have stopped velocity of money. And I've proven this with charts over time that that's what's causing it. That's why we've got this disinflationary trend in the world, even though we, we're in a temporary inflationary trend. And it's been that, that the Fed have debased currency to try and offset. The baby boomers have, and I did this whole long two and a half hour thing that people should watch on the Real Vision YouTube channel with Robert Breedlove about why we got here. It's a very long two and a half hour video, and I can't tell you how important it is. But the baby boomers, with the debasement of currency over time, found that their income didn't go up. But the assets did, because there was too many of them competing for these assets. This is before debasement. And so they borrowed money to fund the gap. When we started the big debt boom, it was all driven by this demographic. So yeah, go and check out that video. It's, I think it's pinned to the, our YouTube channel. That, that, that's a big issue here. It's a bigger issue with this demographic game, because that's one of the rules of the game that you can't change. So what happens over the next 15 years as boomers start dying? They will get, firstly, more propensity to not spend. So when my dad retired, dad used to quite like spending money. You know, he, he was reasonably, you know, he was a middle class, reasonably, did reasonably well, not phenomenally well. And what happened the moment he retired, he's like, fuck, this is a fixed sum of money. I don't know how long I'm going to live for, and my wife's probably going to outlive me. So his spending pattern probably in two years fell 65%. Wow. You know, he was the guy who'd buy champagne. He'd go out for dinner with friends, buy a bottle of champagne, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You know, by the time he hit 76, he'd be on the five euro special at the supermarket because he just didn't want to not run out of money. The worst thing for him is him to die which he did, and leave my mum with no money. Because then his whole sense of self is tied up. In it. So anyway, so it's really strongly driven by these kind of things. So I think as they get older, it get, actually gets worse. But they are going to die. So we've got, and I'm going to guess, 15-ish years, and then they start dropping like flies. That's right. And that's, so then we've got the other issue, right, which is depopulation of the world, right? That's coming at scale. But this gets offset by technology. So if you look at Amazon warehouses, Amazon is employing robots at a faster rate than humans. And the robots, there's now half a million of them. And one and a half million people work for Amazon. But the robots work three times as many hours and are probably twice as productive. So, and they never have a holiday, nothing, right? So that's going to happen at scale and replace the baby boomers. But what's going to happen when the baby boomers' money floods into the system? I mean, that's, I heard some crazy number about how much money baby boomers have locked, but they're going to give that, I mean, charity, kids, whatever, but it's, it's going to come so, in in a pretty rapid I've clip. heard this story before. There's one economy that's led everything. That's Japan. The issue was, is that people start living longer. The Japanese actually passed on the wealth to their retired kids. Whoa. That was the problem. Because <laughs> if you had your, if you lived to 90 and you had your kids at 20, your kids are 70 by the time you die. Wow. And so they didn't get the wealth effect of the part, 
changeover in wealth. Now, not every economy is as long living as Japanese, and the Americans are forty second longest living. It's inexcusable. Um, you know, considering GDP, um, how much they spend on healthcare as a percentage of GDP, it's inexcusable what happens in the US. But you just can't eat like that. I'll just say it. Yeah, you can't eat like that, and you can't have the the drug companies involved as far as they are. Um, so I don't know if there's a big wall of money coming, Tom. That's almost and, more scary. And I think people's jobs get replaced by technology. But I think there is a productivity boom, which we've not had for a long time because of this retired population and debt. I think this, what I call the exponential age, this rise of technologies may give us more wealth per GDP. Hmm. So it'll manifest itself in ways that we don't know. Now, it doesn't matter if it's stuck, right? Because as long as it's in a pension fund that's investing in VC, that's driving technology, it's okay. I mean, the worst thing to happen is for you spend it on bags of chips and cans of drink, because then you're creating food inflation. What you actually want is it to create GDP growth. So by pension funds lending it or giving it investing in companies, VC companies, you're fueling new technology, new wealth, new GDP. Okay, so that brings me back to uh, velocity of capital, people putting funds into the market. If you could snap your fingers and make central banks go away, would you? Probably not. I'm kind of like you. I'm actually quite centrist in most things. I can see the absurdities of, of everything. But given the basket of stuff, I asked many people who were like, I hate the Fed. I'm like, okay, 2008, what would you have done? Well, I wouldn't have got there in the first place. I'm like, okay, but they did. And how do you get there in the first place? Well, and again, watch that video with, with Robert Breedlove. I'm like, well, that was a factor of, of, um, of globalization. Would you have stopped that and foreseen the outcome of that? And then that was a function of the baby boomers and World War II. And there were so many factors. It's like, no, they're doing the best that they can. Now, nobody wants the debasement of currency. But if you don't, what is the outcome? That's why I ask people. If you don't buy the debt, if you allow the collateral of the system, because the US is the most indebted economy in the history of the world as a percentage of world GDP. Whoa. It's over 100% of world GDP in debt. That's a lot. And that's not just, that's the country, the people, the corporations, right? It's the whole lot, the total debt. So what do you want to do? What do you want to do? Do you want to let all of that collateral go to zero, the whole system burn to the ground, and a complete destruction of lifestyle, even whether we're living in a fancy lifestyle driven by debt and other stuff? Do you want to destroy all of that? I don't think you would. I don't think anybody would. So in which case, you need the central banker to try and just juggle the bloody balls in the air. And yes, we get angry because it kind of gets the rich get richer because it keeps driving those assets up and the poor get poorer. So we have to focus somehow on that. But America doesn't like the idea of helping poor people. They think it seems to be you're a communist. It's ridiculous. You know, why would you not have a welfare state? if you've destroyed the ability for wages in real terms to rise over the last 50 years, they've not risen at all. So you need to think about this. And this is why technology people are thinking about universal basic income, because these same people in the workforce are going to compete against robots and have no chance, zero chance. So there is a lot of structural issues here. And I don't think you can do this without government. And I don't think you can do it without central banks. And I don't think central banks, they've made some mistakes and big mistakes. They made a mistake in 1997, which was cutting interest rates to defend the stock market. The leverage hadn't built as big by then. And we could have had a clearing event and the leverage wouldn't build up. That's what's happening in crypto, right? The leverage can't build up. It just cannot do it because it keeps getting blown out. Why? Because there's no counterpart but look at how vicious the cycles are so do you want the whole economy to go through the crypto cycle well you can do that that's not having a central bank it, there's yeah, so many right. trade-offs as you as you suggest so i think for a generalized population 
you would trade smoothness and some level acceptable level of debasement or inflation whatever you're looking at some acceptable level versus an economy that does this and you can't you don't know when to save or how to invest because the wealth yeah, i don't even think we would far. ever get there i think people would turtle up so fast you would just be in protect mode uh, man even just looking at so i as somebody who but this is uh, going to make us really hated this video tom by so because we're both saying the same thing and people yeah, are going to go how dare you can't I you get see what it. they're doing I get it. And that's the thing I wanted people to know, like, hey, the beast from Jekyll Island, the conspiracies, like I, they may even all be true. Let's just assume for now that they are true. All of it is still born out of the nature of the human animal. And they're having now been in, uh, I'll say blockchain instead of crypto, because the part that I function in is very much not a currency. Looking at that and going, hey, I, I'm totally down for some rules. I would just like to know what those rules are. I don't want to have to guess at what the rules are. And then you come later and you're very angry. So I like to just let's have what the rules are. We can debate the rules. We can fight about the rules, all that. But now we can move forward in a, a far more reasonable way. But I don't think that things settle on stability if you have the ability for the more powerful, that could be physical, could be intellectual, like I, I really think Sam Bankman Freed has a talent for being able, to, and, and it could be just of this moment where that sort of, he's got the geek chic look. He's, I've never, I, I've, I actually haven't even seen an interview with him, but I will assume that what I hear is correct, that he's a very smart guy. He's certainly able to convince people that he's a smart guy. So he understands something about this that he was able to leverage against other people. And I think that will always happen. And what governments are is basically, and this is going to sound terrible, but governments are the weaker people saying, well, we're going to get our asses handed to us physically, intellectually. So let's come together as a collective. And as much as like that can spiral into tyranny, I'm well aware. As somebody who runs a business in California, let me tell you how aware I am of that there is a pathological side on that side, but I think there's a pathological side on this side. And if we're gonna find a real path forward, I think people need to understand the rules of the game. I think we have to stabilize the rules of the game. I'm gonna add some complications to this too. Please, of course. So one of the arguments about the Fed that people have is they're not elected officials. And therefore we should have a say how much our currency gets debased or whatever. But the crowd is not always very good at making these decisions either. And Brexit is a great example. Brexit, the unintended consequences have been enormous. I don't know anything about it. So what have been the second and third order consequences? So there was, you know, all these Brits love to go on holiday to Spain, France, Italy. They had all their holiday homes. They got to retire. They wanted to spend you know, six months a year in one country. And now they're finding they're not allowed to, and they have to leave. And they're like, what? But we're British, how dare you? And we're like, no, no, you're not part of the EU anymore. You have no rights. You have no rights over the healthcare system there. And they're like, well, this is not what we agreed to. At the border in France, you can drive a, a car from France to Spain, to Italy, to Austria, do anything you want. You don't even go to passport control. Brits at the border in huge long lines getting in and have to produce all the right papers. They're like, but we're British. How dare you? Like, you've you voted out. So normally speaking, that should have been done not as a referendum. It should have been done as a political process. And that was going on as a process that takes years of debate and discussion. And voters can say we like that party because they're against leaving or for leaving, and that's fine, but it gets debated properly over an extended period of time. What we did was say, you, you make the decision instantly. And I was like, well, okay. Completely not given the tools and they screw up. So do we want to give the same tools to everybody with interest rates? 
Do they even know what drives the economy? Now, no, I don't think the Fed are particularly point. good with that either. I think they do a terrible job on forecasting the economy. And that's why, you know, Fintwit gets so angry with them. It's like, it's bloody obvious we're going into recession and you won the battle on inflation. But you're going to keep fighting it and you're going to make it worse for people. And then people are going to lose their jobs and going to be angry at you again. And, this, and so on and so forth. But nobody's ever managed to make the business cycle flat. Nobody. It, yeah. it's, a, it's a degree of what volatility you'll accept. When I started um, doing the research for this interview, obviously you and I interact quite a bit, but when I started doing the research for this interview, I thought I would hear a lot more pessimism out of you about recession, about you know uh, global economic collisions from Russia and Ukraine to China, and that looked like they were imploding for a while, but you're pretty optimistic. So I'm very curious um, what's happening right now. So firstly, most people need to realize that doom porn sells. It catches attention. Fear is the strongest human emotion, right? And so you see a lot of it because it, it grabs attention. So we need to break apart to two parts here. One is what do I think of the economy? And the other is what do I think about markets? So my economic view is, I think most of us even know it, is we're in recession. We're in recession and it's probably going to get a bit worse. And there's a lot of people going to lose their jobs and businesses are going to find it hard. Um, there's less money around and it's going to be pretty miserable. Um, and it's the sort of miserableness that you go through periodically that is not catastrophic. So it's a recession. And recessions are uh, as old as humanity itself. So we've just had... What's confusing people, in my view, is we're so screwed up by the last three events. One was the pandemic. So there's no normality. What was the recession look like there? That was the weirdest one. Then 2008 was the end of the entire financial system. And then 2001 was this spectacular tech, tech collapse. So people have an anchoring bias. It's like, well, it's the end of the world. Really, when I started... When I graduated university, it was 1990, and it was a terrible time to graduate because it was a recession and there were no jobs. And I wanted to go into finance, and they were firing people as fast as possible. And it took a while. It took a while. House prices went down for a while, and people didn't get jobs for a while, and people were laid off for a while. And the stock market went down 20%. It was a decent size of recession as well. Went down 20%. Took some time to recover. The jobs came back. The economy was cleaner. They got rid of some of the worst excesses of leverage. And the world moved forwards. And before you knew it, all of the 90s was a boom. I'm kind of of that opinion, is we have no systemic collapse coming. We don't have those kind of issues. And we've invented the magic printer, the money printer of quantitative easing that papers over all troubles. So we don't have that coming. Societally, yeah, we've got a whole bunch of issues to get through a US election with all this AI and the anger and the populism. But forget all of that. Again, you can easily go down the doom or you can enjoy the community you've got around you. And there's different ways you can have lenses, perspectives on the world. Investing, the job of markets is to look forwards. If you tell me 100% of all economists are forecasting a recession, it's kind of no shit, Sherlock. Um, and therefore, is it in the price or is are all those stock market people really stupid? All of those machines that they haven't heard you at all? No, they actually understand this and it's a real time probability waiting business. So it kind of knows that. And what it looks forward to is, OK, how bad is this? Is it catastrophic? Is the world going to end? What's going to happen? And the markets are telling you, no. It's probably done. My, my my view is the bottom is in in markets and the bottom was in in crypto in June and for Bitcoin was in October, November. The bottom was in for the stock markets in October as most end of bear markets happen. It priced in a recession and we move forwards from here. And eventually they'll cut rates again. And if you think about it, is we had a total shutdown of the global economy, then a reopening of the global economy, that has caused this inflation that's hurt everybody. And eventually, we'll just rebalance back to some form of normality. 
there's a massive amount of doom porn about inflation is going to be structurally here forever. We're all going to die, which is kind of, I'm more like you are with the AI side where I'm actually like, you know what? We've just developed AI. We've got relentless technology. The price of energy is coming lower from all different sources. Productivity of humanity is growing. Um, so I think, I think it's actually probably an interesting time. It's an interesting time because everybody's so bearish. Psychology plays a huge part in markets because everybody expects inflation to be relentless and ongoing and for the rest of our lives, much like, what, 24 months ago? Everyone was like, every tech stock's going up forever and every business is, can never fail again. You know, we're humans. We, we make forecasting errors of quite wide amounts at various points. So, yes, no, I'm, and I spend a huge, so I'm not just saying this because I'm just chatting to you. I mean, I do an enormous amount of work on this. I write 150 pages of research. I sit down and write it every month. I've been doing that for 19 years. Um, and so that comes with 2,000 charts and models and stuff with myself and uh, uh, my colleague, Julian Bittle, from secular themes, short-term themes. doesn't mean I'm not wrong as well. I can clearly be wrong, but I just think it's in the price and what we the worst part of it is is the stock market is going to be going up probably it won't rock it up at first but eventually it'll pick up while we're all feeling the pain <laughs> because know? people are looking forward and so they're saying okay the bottom's in now's the time to get in we know we're going to go up from here so even though we're still sort of going through it. People are losing their jobs, but wise investors are like, you just need to project so, this out into the future. Yeah, so there's a time horizon of how the business cycle works. Currently, the thing that leads it the most is the Chinese credit cycle. Who knew? But it is right now, 17 months ahead. So when it turned up 17 months ago, we we're starting to say, huh, okay, there's something happening here. It also forecasts the recession. And then, and then you've got other forward-looking indicators about nine months out um we've got a bunch of indicators but the last thing in the stack is rents and the one before that is wages so wages are going up right this now but they take a while and then they start coming down again they won't deflate nobody's going to really come to you and force you to take a uh a pay cut but it means that they, they don't keep going up but your rents will probably come down um, and so that's a function of uh, these things just take time. The unemployment rise hasn't even started. Now, we can see everybody laying off. Uh, every company is laying off people, thinking about tightening costs. Everyone can see it from sponsorship, advertising, sales. I mean, it's everywhere. I mean, every single person I speak to is like, Christ, it's miserable out there. But the unemployment side doesn't really come until it should start in the next month or two. And then that goes on for nine months of just relentlessly higher unemployment rates. So anybody watching so, this- it's, Why is that it, so predictable? Why nine months? It's just how it always is, because companies make decisions, and whether it's around board meetings, however it's done, they get to a certain point where they hit the panic button um, and they lay people off. That's usually when the bottom of the recession starts. It's usually when rates start getting cut. It's usually when the stock market often recovers as well. So for people watching this, there's two parts of this. One is if you're an investor, you might be able to buy these technology stocks with this renaissance of amazing changes happening around us at prices down 70% from where they were two years ago, a year ago. Okay, that's kind of interesting because your expected future return goes up. Same with crypto. You know, you and I have talked about this. You buy when the Psych the business cycle brings it back to the the bottom of the secular uptrend. That's where we are. These are where you make all the money. This is what you get paid for to take risk here. You, you, you don't get paid to take risk at the top and you tend to lose money. So these are the moments in time. So that's very interesting as an investor. But anybody watching this, think about your cash flows. Just think about your cash flow. Think about your expenditure. And just say, just be a little bit careful because losing a job or having your own business struggling for a period of time. And I think the worst of it will be over relatively fast, but 
yeah, it's these laggy Ballpark effects. Me. What's what's relatively fast? So I said so we're Baltimore recording Man. this in in March of twenty three. When do we think this turns around? So I think the bottom of the economic cycle is in the next quarter. So I think we've got a really ugly quarter to come. But the problem is, it's that shock that sets off the companies to go, I need to lay off some staff, all of that. And it's that process that begins the healing. So the what is big- that shock? So if that shock isn't people getting laid off, what is the shock that's coming in the next quarter? The shock coming in the next quarter is, is the general slowdown from interest rates, you know, biting into all of these indebted companies or households or credit cards and all of this stuff. And everybody goes, uh-uh, I'm not going to spend money. That is what a recession is. You know, it's not usually driven by a pandemic. It's not usually driven by the entire financial system collapsing. It's usually by all of us making a rational decision of, I'm just not going to spend money right now because things are a bit uncertain. And that is what causes recessions. And I'm actually telling people to do exactly that because it's the rational thing to do. What you do, if you're going to panic, panic early. And I'm not talking about the stock market going down either. I think we've had that. It went down. The Nasdaq went down 38%. That's pretty much bang in line with a regular bear market. But what I'm saying is in your personal life, where it really matters, where the rubber hits the road, is panic early. Just look at your expenditure, look at your cost, look at your business. So what do I need to do here uh, just to make sure that I can just get through a pretty shitty year? But 2024, probably pretty decent. So what is the natural cycle of things? Why do people begin to warm back up and what are the threats, if any, that you see looming? So housing, I'm hearing housing bubble bursting, problem Doom there. porn. Doom porn. Is, is that it? It's just people are overreacting, not real. The housing market is expensive. Interest rates have gone up. So people are going to buy less houses. Hmm. Yes. Will house prices come down? Yes, because they went up a lot. Will the activity in the housing market dry up for maybe two years? Yeah, most likely. Um, Are we going to see a leverage crash? No, because nobody's really got a lot of leverage at household level in property. That was something that happened in 2008. It's been too expensive and too difficult to do. So I think the home builders have a bit of trouble because they got a lot of inventory. They can't sell it. They need to finance it for a couple of years. It sits around 1990, 91, 92 was very similar. I was in London then. It was pretty shitty in the property market. It was great for me because I just entered the property market at the end of that. So prices were relatively low. They hadn't come down a lot, but they hadn't gone up a lot. And my income was going up because I was in my 20s. So income goes up every year because you're hopefully getting promoted and stuff like that. So, um, but, you know, a few property developers went bust. Things were slow. And then eventually it, it cleaned up. So I'm more of that opinion that, you know, house prices come off 10% maybe even 15%, you know, some areas that were really hot come down a bit further, but it doesn't expose any catastrophic leverage. The banking system is more than adequately compensated with capital. Um, It's hugely sold in the United States. So it's just a bad time. It's just a bad time. What do you think about about rates? Are they going to continue to go up? Is there, because the Fed, as far as I know, is signaling that they are going to keep taking rates up. Yeah, so every single forward-looking indicator that I have on inflation suggests that inflation utterly collapses. Um, If you want to see a real-time inflation data, look at something called Trueflation, T-R-U-flation. It's actually on blockchain. It takes hundreds of thousands of individual prices on a real-time basis. Mm. Um, And it tells you where inflation is today. And US inflation today is about 4.74%. Wow. Versus the headline, which says six. So, and if we think of what inflation is, is the year on year comparison. What happened last year? Well, between March and June was Russia invading Ukraine and every commodity going through the roof. Mm. So, we're going to see the flip side of that. So, we will see inflation come off very fast. All my forward looking indicators that, that look at it from different angles all suggest the same. So, I think the Fed is speaking max aggression because they want to make sure that out of the embers doesn't rise the phoenix again. Mm. So they just want to stamp out people's expectations of higher prices in the future. They know there's a recession coming. They can see the inflation's coming. So uh, that um, recession's coming. So I think it's the final game, which is like get down and stay down. Um, 
And then that, that's what they've done. And so my guess is we'll be having this conversation in September, September, somewhere between September and December, and they'll have cut rates. Whoa, you think they're going to start cutting that fast. So how does... And the market is telling rates... you that that's... And the market and the Fed are saying that's wrong, that's not true. We're here higher for longer. But if unemployment is going to rise, they have two mandates, inflation and unemployment. Inflation is going to be falling and unemployment rising. They cannot go to Congress and say, oh, yeah, we're just going to do this a bit longer. They're just going to fire them all. There is politics involved in the end. So, no, they will cut rates. And they should do by then, for sure. So how is it, though, going back to the idea of the embers is the place from which the phoenix is going to rise and, you know, we're going to go rocketing back into euphoria and end up back in the same spot. How does cutting rates that soon? Why not hold? You won't be asking for that in, in September. You'll be begging them. Because your what's going to happen... If your, I'm friends will be lo- your friends will be losing jobs. People are you know, getting decimated. There's houses in your street that don't sell. You're like, really, guys? What do you want to do, destroy everybody? That's that's how it always works. And then also, everyone's got a lot of debt. All the corporations in America, plus the households, are 120% of GDP in debt. And the US government's 100% of GDP in debt. And they have- that, That's the one I want to talk about. So- the when I think about the US government and the amount of debt that we're carrying, and I think about interest rates being this high, it it is there a conversation? I know I'm asking you to prognosticate here, but is there a conversation going on between the US government and the Fed of like, hey, get ready to pull those rates down because they themselves have all this debt service that they're gonna have to do? Yes. And I think it's global. I'm, I'm, I've just been developing, uh, I've written a lot of it. I, sorry, I'm not finishing any sentence. I've just cut, discovered something that really quite shocked me that I've been writing a lot about to get my thought process in Global Macro Investor. My understanding is that all debt that the US has borrowed above GDP growth, so if GDP grows at 2% and debt growth grows at 4%, everything above is only for financing interest payments since 2009, since the recession. And so that, all of that money is the exact same amount as the size of the Fed balance sheet. So they are issuing bonds to pay the interest, that's so that's paying your credit card with another credit card, and then giving it to your dad and say, Well, you settle the bill. Whoa. It's which is the Fed. So I think they completely know what's going on. And and I haven't really shared this with anybody yet. I also think it's global and it's understood. And it's all smoke and mirrors that we never saw what the game was. And I think I've proven it that this is all, all the central banks did. This is what quantitative easing. And step back is what, what am I talking about in this scrambled nonsense that I'm saying? The US, for easy maths, long-term trend rate of growth is 1.75%, but let's call it 2%. Interest rates have been average around 2%, let's say, for easy maths. And the government is 100% of GDP in debt. So, so therefore, their interest payments are 2% of the entire GDP, which is how much the economy grows. Okay, put that over there. Oh, but you guys in the private sector, you're also 100% of GDP in debt. Where does your 2% come from? Because GDP is all of the activity in the economy, and that's just gone to the government. Sorry, guys. You're either going to go bust or we're going to blow up and you're going to blow up the banking system or or we're going to have to keep eating this negative growth difference of 2% every year until you get rid of this debt and we're all fucked. So once you realize that these two pools are both 100%, you realize, okay, somebody is going to have to do something so it ends up on the Fed balance sheet. So when you go to Japan, really interesting because Japan, the households are massive savers. 
companies are pretty in debt, but the government's massively in debt. And it's the same, but because their interest rates are lower, they can have more debt. But their economy grows really slow as well. So you get to a certain point, and then you have to say, right, it has to go into the balance sheet. The Europeans have been doing the same. The Brits have been doing the same. It's all the same thing. It's like a, there was like a, it feels that, and this is going to sound ridiculous, it feels like there was a global treaty of which, okay, this is where we are. We can't, the debt has got too big and nobody can pay the interest payments without destroying the global economy. So we're just going to have to pretend we're not um, debasing the currency and call it quantitative easing and say it's a precise way of injecting money exactly into the right part of the financial system. And it's like, no, what you're doing is getting a credit card to pay off your credit card and then giving it to your dad and say, you, you worry about this. It's not my problem. Wow. So I want to see if I'm if I'm tracking this because not to get back into doom porn, but this seems pretty <laughs> doom porny. Uh, okay. So for people, but it's that not because the world works. It's not doom porn because it works. Ooh, Every it, time they do it, it working, assets go or are off. we just pushing off a problem? Okay. So it's making assets go up when they do it. It is meaning that companies don't default. The banking system remains sound. But are but we actually able to get out of out of debt? So let me make sure I'm understanding what you're saying. This is going to be very important. Okay, so the I know we're using round numbers, but this is very helpful. So worldwide GDP, gross domestic product, the, the amount of productivity. So the capital that is usable effectively, uh, you have two different people that have debt in that amount, which uh, th there's no one to to have real money to pay the fucking thing off. So if you had one person that was like, okay, we're maxed out, we're at 2%, but GDP is 2%, cool. We have the path, just be frugal and, and you've got a path out of this. But when you have two people that owe the whole amount effectively, you now go into money printing. And I mean, if this works, I'm actually okay with it. I know how that's gonna get me lit up. But it. so the solution here is, okay, we have two, two large groups, governments, private sector, which are all the groups that exist. And each one of them owes the entire worldwide GDP in debt. You can't both be in that situation. There's no Peter, there's no, uh, you can't rob a Peter to pay Paul because they're both in the same situation. So now the only thing left is printing money, devaluing everybody to get out of the situation. But the way in which we do that by buying things from uh, the private sector is we're making people that hold assets wealthier. We're increasing the gap between the rich and the poor because the way that we inject money into the system only reaches people that own assets. And so we've created this problem. And the only way out is to print money, which is going to increase the, the, the Gini coefficient for people that know that phrase, where it's like, nobody cares in absolute dollars how much you have. You just hate that your neighbor, Timmy, has more than you. And so you freak the fuck out. And so it becomes the differential that becomes the destabilizing element. So what you said, assuming what I just repeated is correct that sounds destabilizing okay. and doom porn so help what is the other what is the other outcome the other outcome is let it all burn clearly a terrible idea when you're this far in debt let it all burn doesn't work anymore right that's the end of that's the kind of end of civilization stuff ultra doom porn so you're faced with doom porn and ultra doom porn. What do you oh take? God. Right, there is no other way. So this is what people need to understand. What is GDP? GDP is the sum of all the economic activity that goes on. And it's comprised, GDP growth rates are comprised very simply of the number of people in your economy. Is it growing? If it's growing, your economy grows because there's more people generating more activity, generally. Secondly, is 
How much productivity does it have? I, are those people productive? Do they make a lot of stuff for each man hour? And finally, is how fast is debt growing? So when we have an aging population, the number of humans declines over time. What happens is we stopped immigration almost everywhere because everyone was under pressure for income because real wages haven't gone up. So we, we, we lowered the rate of immigration, so that lowers trend rate of growth. Aging population, they're less productive and they spend less. So GDP keeps doing this for decades on end, baked in the cake from, from that. They become less productive because they're older people and a whole bunch of them aren't in the labor force anymore. Okay, so you're not very productive, you're getting old, not population growing. So guess what? Bingo, answer, debt. Ding, 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 ding. We just took on debt. Right. It was rational until it's not. It's like it's rational to super leverage yourself on a house and house prices go up and you look like a god until you get it wrong and you lose everything. So it was rational to take the debt and this is where we got to. And then it was the government's got into the same boat and everyone was just the debt. So now the debt is the debt. Debt growth is actually not that high anymore because we've hit the ceiling. So the only way to solve this, this goes back to our earlier conversation, is we cannot solve population growth. And debt growth is peaked out. So we've got the one thing in the middle called productivity. And that takes us right back to AI and the robots and cryptocurrencies, Internet of Things, green energy, all of these things. So if you are governments, look what Europe's doing. It's interesting. And maybe I'm just inventing a narrative. But Europe, the US, Japan, they all know what they're doing. So they're printing money to cover their bills. Um, and Europe thinks, well, Christ, we need to get the bloody economy going here because GDP growth is what pays our bills. And it's pretty sluggish because everyone's old here and everyone's in debt and the banking system is a mess. Let's do a double whammy, which is what the US did back in the 40s. Let's put as much stimulus as we can from this fake money and ram it into the green energy sector. And we're going to build a lot of stuff. And we understand a lot of stuff is going to be wasted capital, but out of it, we're going to do one amazing thing. And the, it will happen is out of this energy costs will collapse. Now, this is really important for people to understand. What does technology do? Technology drives more productivity out of a single unit of energy. It kind of, once you see this thing, it's like that's what humans do with everything. It's like find a way of getting, extracting more for that barrel of oil, because that's what we use. Now that barrel of oil has been our fixed energy source since we replaced whale oil. So we've been using this and so it's been the constant. So technology has had to drive all the productivity in every way it can based on how much is this. So we've had to bring computational power down, everything down. So that one fixed thing, which is the price of oil, which on a inflation adjusted basis has been pretty stable for the last 70, 80 years. And if what the US is doing with its Inflation Act and the Europeans are doing with its green energy and Japan is doing and China is doing and Australia is doing and the UK is doing, if they force enough investment in, they will change the energy source of the world. And because all of these have exponential downtrends in cost, we will change the energy coefficient. And what happens is productivity times the lowering the cost of energy is an exponential change for all of us. That's how you solve this. There's almost no other way of solving this problem of slow GDP growth, old populations, massive debts without blowing up everything. So you're going to have to keep doing this money printing thing, which is miserable because it makes some people rich and other people poor. And or you can have inflation, which just makes everybody miserable. <laughs> They're all terrible things. But the faster you can get to changing that productivity equation, the better, because it's the it's the only way. There's no there's simply no other way of solving it. You either That's rob really, from everybody or grow the economy. With a declining population. Um, so talk to me about the energy. You're saying that 
so maybe I have uh, just an undereducated view on the green energy front. So you see the cost of energy coming down as we invest more and more into the green energy side? Yes. So right now we're in transition where we're not probably producing enough oil and we don't have enough energy coming out of solar, wind, geothermal, nuclear, all of that. So, you know, we've got this market where energy prices are high because of supply issues and other stuff. But when you look at the trend, all of these are growing as a percentage share of the energy grid. There's still oil and coal are still massive, right? But they're coming down and Europe's really forcing it, uh, decarbonization. And so we're seeing a rise of these others. They start some of them subsidized, but the subsidies go over time. But the really interesting thing is none of that. It's the fact that the cost per unit of energy keeps coming down. And many of these are now cheaper than natural gas, which was very cheap. So it's like, huh, okay. And we've only just started where we are in this exponentiality. So my view is in 20 years time, the cost of energy will be marginal for everybody and everything. Much like the cost of water is marginal for everybody. Um, and the cost of many things we take for granted are totally marginal. Now, I don't know if given your um, macro outlook that this is a reasonable question to ask you or not, but um, when I, when you look out at uh, the rate of adoption of green energy, do you think that we're, because you just said like maybe we're not producing enough oil and gas, do you think that we're moving too rapidly in that direction? Or do you think, no, 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 you, you make these huge investments, you have to put regulation in place, force people to do it faster because these have a, a far more technology-based exponential. Um, okay, so, so this is the inverse of the GDP problem. Do you manage its smooth decline or do you blow up? Here, do you transition slowly with the issues of climate change and the issues of um, cost of energy and all these other things and the need for productivity? Or do you blow up? I do you just take short term pain to get to the promised land faster? Again, it's probably a rational economic decision to do that. So maybe or maybe not energy prices rise. I'm not entirely sure. Will copper prices rise? Probably. Will some prices rise? Probably. Can that be offset by AI and other deflationary pressures? Probably. You know, it's not baked in the cake. People always conflate some commodity going up in price to see inflation's back and it's all going to run rampant again. It's very rare that that happens. We've just had it now. So it's going to be in everybody's head as the boogie monster, but they're looking at, they're usually looking at the wrong boogie monster. So, so it's going to be a balancing act and um, maybe they get it right. Maybe they get it wrong, but I think they're all pretty, most of these governments are pretty sure that they want to do it as fast as they can. And so does that mean that they would, if by their actions, they cause high energy prices for five years, would they give out stimulus handouts to people? Probably. Is that not the best way to say, listen, if you are getting hurt by this? And guess what? That's exactly what Europe's just done mm. last year. It was giving handouts to people to say, look, we understand your electricity bill is high and it's hard for you. So we'll, we'll help you. Um, now, did that drive inflation to some extent? Maybe, but maybe not. I mean, it was just going for the electricity bill. You didn't give people extra money in their pocket. So it's complicated as everything is, but I don't know. I'm kind of in a, I'm a fan of, if you're going to go for positive change, do it as fast as possible. If you're going to go to negative change and you can glide path, take the glide path. Very interesting. So, um, and I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of quantitative easing or any of that stuff. I'm just like this evil, this evil. Which one do you want to choose? Yeah, it uh, is a very interesting question. So when you were talking, I was in, in full acknowledgement of the human mind goes to the problems. Um, in the context we're in now, and I, I am not a geopolitical thinker, and so I want to be very clear about that. I want people to understand that I am, I am seeking to uh, increase the island of my knowledge. Um, when I when I look at as somebody who has 
studied from a how do evil people get control perspective, studied what Hitler did in World War II, he was very much like not seeing the increase in productivity path out of things. And so he's like, well, for Germany to get out from under this terrible weight, we have to start land grabbing. And when I so see what, Russia... That is the population part of the equation, right? When you're taking over countries, what you're actually doing is getting their people and resources. So you're solving for your own population, productivity, more resources, but you're actually getting the people part of the GDP equation. That's interesting. So um, how do you contextualize Russia and the Ukraine in this moment where you've got the private sector, the governments are completely indebted, you're at a position where birth rates are declining, certainly in the Western world, very rapidly. If demographics are destiny and we are just in a, a shit show demographically, does that, when you were talking, I started looking at the Russia, Ukraine thing in a totally different light. And I'm very much somebody on the outside of that. I'm not close to it at all. Uh, but I'm very curious if that sort of recontextualization of, oh, this is somebody who's like, well, I know how to solve this problem quite rapidly. Uh, or am I looking at it wrong? Um, I don't like geopolitics because so much of it is stuff that we don't know. So there's so much conjecture about almost everything in geopolitics, apart from the fact that Russian troops are in Ukraine and they're fighting each other. Whose motivations of what, for what and how, I don't even know. But one thing it did do, to go back to what we were talking about, it accelerated Europe. Everyone thought, well, the Europeans are going to back away from their green energy policy now, aren't they? The Europeans went, no, fuck you. We're now super motivated to get this done as fast as possible because we do not want to be beholden to Russia or the United States or anybody else for that matter. Energy independence is an incredible thing, right? It's one of the powers that superpowers that the United States has, has energy independence. All other energy on earth could go and the US has oil and gas and more of it than pretty much anybody else in the world. So I, so it also, if you think about the history of war and how much has been fought over the Middle East, not because we want some sand or the few people, because we want the energy and we want to control it because the energy is the thing. I can't remember what it was called in, in, um, in uh, Dune, but whatever the thing is, right? Humans want to control the thing, whether it was whale oil or this or whatever, the thing. Spice, right? In spice Dune. that's right spice so that's what that's what the u.s controls and the russia controls a bunch of it and we want to change that equation and the europeans are in the middle with not, with not enough of it and it's in everybody's interest for everybody to walk away from this one commodity ruling the world mm. because it's not the commodity we care about it's the energy we care about well said Talk to me about China. Um, seemed for a while like things were getting pretty dicey. You had people, if it can be believed, people protesting like crazy, uh, governments making funds unavailable to people. Um, I saw that happen in Cyprus up close, given that Lisa's family is from Cyprus. Um, uh, what What's the status of things? Uh A, China's economy was slowing down and they locked themselves into a really brutal lockdown for the pandemic. And even the Chinese people who are quite compliant, you know, Asian populations tend to be more societally compliant than US who kind of like saying fuck you to everybody if it doesn't suit their interests. So, you know, Europeans are quite societally minded as well, generally speaking. Um, so the Chinese asked too much of their people. For whatever reason, I don't know whether it was actually for a real reason in the end, or whether it's for autocratic reasons or whatever. Anyway, economic growth falls off a cliff. Uh, people are angry. Growth is weakening. Property markets a mess. That's where that's one of the big wealth gates for everybody in China. That's where people make money. Um, people in the streets and people are angry. The Chinese have kind of, interesting enough, started stimulating. 
And then, you know, they locked up all these entrepreneurs and threw them in prison or mm. threw them down a well. Um, they're now like, well, we've decided we need to be growing at five and a half percent a year. And we want entrepreneurs back in, you know, and they've reopened Hong Kong for cryptocurrency. So it feels like whatever they were doing, they've got what they wanted, whether it was because she wanted to get control again. The Game of Thrones is not a game that I, I like to get involved in. And because everybody speculates, we don't know. All I know, Chinese are stimulating. They want the economy to grow. And um, they seem to want to be an entrepreneur. I don't know why you choose to be an entrepreneur in China, because, you know, the next cycle around, you, you get shot and replaced by the next one. But <laughs> somebody's going to do it. That's so interesting. I, I didn't know that so, they had reopened back up. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So again, think about mentality. We're at the bottom. This is the worst. Markets, forward looking, our Chinese stock market's up like 50% already. And they're driving parts of the global cycle. So when you read it in the news headlines, it's usually too late. Did you hear the recent speech? I think it was in uh, the European Parliament. Oh, God. Uh, I don't know exactly where it was. The speech was in English, though. And uh, they were saying basically uh, that we want to degrowth. And they made it sound like this is going to be amazing, greatest thing ever, degrowth, uh, less people on the planet, just all good, all good. Um, but you're saying that's a bad assumption. So, No, the bad assumption is that it creates wage inflation. The degrowth... Okay, degrowth at first creates more for less people. Okay, great. And if you can distribute that, great. The issue is at the end of it, you end up with the robots and the AI. Because you are hyper incentivized to keep increasing productivity, that you are sowing the seeds of our own demise. Because of the economic engine is actually forcing you to, to take this incentive. It's kind of weird, but that's where it's going. Woof. Okay. Because the answer to this slow growth and this shrinking population is more productivity. The way of creating productivity is robots, AI, et cetera. The faster they grow, the more that we use them, the more that we need them because the population is smaller. This is why Elon Musk keeps saying, people don't understand this. He keeps saying shrinking population is bad. It's not bad for economic growth going down. It's bad because it incentivizes everybody to increase the workforce. So the, the, hum um, the, the population side of the equation can be offset by the machines. So look at an Amazon warehouse, perfect example. Amazon has gone from having one and a half million people, uh, about a million people working there and zero robots to a million people and 500,000 robots. The robots work 24-7, 365. They're more productive than humans in all aspects, and they just keep replacing humans. Sorry, didn't you say and that Amazon, there's still a mu million humans working though? So it's just yeah, increased productivity through robots. So are you saying that that should be to match their scale, it should be 1.5 million people? Correct. So they're replacing the jobs that would have naturally been coming from humans. And this trend will accelerate until there is no need for humans because the machines will have taken over. This is Elon Musk's thing is, the more we try and make these machines more intelligent, the robots better, Elon's building this damn thing himself, right? Mm. Twitter, is the training model for the AI that he's built. And he's got Dojo, one of the largest supercomputers at a, at a focused task that's ever existed. It is the largest. And then he's got the Optimus robot. And there's the end of humanity right there. Because once the genie's out of a bottle. So that's why he's worried. And that's why, you know, you need to pull the ripcord and piss off to Mars. It's not from anything else. It's the logical conclusion of economic forces creating more and more powerful intelligence that doesn't require humans. Okay, now that's what I the feel... singularity gets to. Now I feel seen by you because this is where I'm at. Um, so then take us back to your early statement that you're optimistic about the exponential age, whereas 
what you just said is how I feel about the exponential age when I don't forcibly put my optimistic hat on. Because look, I I ultimately, I default to optimism. I think it's a wiser place to be. I, I certainly think it's a more enjoyable place to be. Um, and I think that people should find that path where they can explain things in a way that end well. And I thank you for letting me wear my more pessimistic hat because I knew you were going to be in the more optimistic seat here. Um, but why, when you look at exponential age, if you can see the the economic forces will incentivize that path, where as population and demographics are destiny, they're in plain sight, everybody can see it, it is going to decline massively, at least temporarily. That That is for sure. And so as the population begins to decline dramatically, as we then, the economic forces push us to lean more into AI and robotics, and the guy closest to the problem is like, hey, P.S., let's get to Mars. Um, where where do you, like, what's the thing that has to go right? Or where do you think that either Elon okay. or, or myself are looking at this wrong? So you're confusing time horizons. A lot of people do this. A lot of people go, the dollar's going to collapse because it's so much in debt. Probably right. Is it going to happen this year, next year, or in 20 years' time? You can't worry about something that is 20 year out because the future paths are yet unknown, right? Because we're, we're too far out. The event horizon is too far out to get high probability forecasting. So we have to make a huge bunch of assumptions. So let's go to the shorter time horizon is, is are we likely to benefit from the ability to superpower human knowledge? Probably. Are we going to benefit from cheapening energy costs? Probably. Are we going to benefit from the things like self-driving cars, driving us to work, delivering packages, drones, all of the stuff? Are we going to benefit from the space technologies and Starlink? Are we going to benefit? Yes, yes, yes. Is the stock market going to go up if we invest in this stuff? Yes. Okay, so there's a lot of benefits that are being laid out for us all. Is longevity of life going to increase? Yes. Are we going to have massive breakthroughs in, in genetic sciences? Yes. Can we train AI models on cancer and all of this stuff? Yes. Right, okay. That to me sounds like a golden age. I call it the Renaissance. Or I'm English, I call it the Renaissance. Um, but that is, but after that, you get to what people refer to as the singularity is where it becomes unforecastable. And this is what the debate is going on amongst Sam Altman, Emad Mostak with um, Elon, Noah Harari, everybody, right? It's that moment. It's like, what the hell does that look like? Elon's like, I don't know, so let's just have a plan B. Makes sense? None of us really want to go to Mars, but I get it, right? If we completely screw this up, but I don't see how the, the virus of technology isn't like in 2001 a space odyssey it just doesn't go with the ship you know so that's i'm, I'm not sure yeah that's my i don't know that are we able as humans because we're so such an adaptive cockroach of a species well we haven't proven to be yet we're still pretty young on the planet versus others but let's assume we're like crocodiles and sharks and we can hang around for a few million years will we figure out an adaptive mechanism to deal with this maybe that's the that's the optimist outcome is like, oh, no, humans, we're humans, we're, we're, we're amazing, we'll figure this out. And the other one is, we're never going to be as smart as these machines, we're so totally fucked. I don't know. But I know that in my lifetime, there's a 20 or 30 year period, which might be a truly extraordinary mo moment in history. And like, and the issue is, is we can't see through the other side of it. And that's terrifying. But you know, it's, you know, we, I think we mentioned this last time we chatted, I don't have kids, so I have to worry about it less. Mm. People who do, I, I get it. I get it. It is an existential threat of which we cannot figure out how to stop it. And regulation, it's, it's not going to stop it because the technology is out of the bottle. It's like you can't stamp crypto out because the technology is out of the bottle now and it's everywhere and yes 
OpenAI is the current leader with Microsoft. But all of the big US companies are incentivized to outcompete each other. And so they're incentivized to create more and more powerful models. But if they get regulated, well, somebody else will do it. This is the geezers you're talking about, or geysers, mm. is they're popping up everywhere. But really what is happening is it's a massive, bloody explosion that is unstoppable. So talk to me, talk to me about regulatory. So as somebody who doesn't live in the US, but you pay attention to the US, uh, you probably have a much clearer picture than somebody like me, who's not only in the US, but I'm in California. Uh, how do you think this is all going to settle out? Is the US going to get left behind? Are we being too strict regulatorily? Um, how does this play out? I mean, this is an impossible choice, right? How do you regulate this thing? And how do you get a bunch of 75-year-old politicians to regulate this thing? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. Oh, we're going to align the models with humanity. What does that even mean? Nobody even knows how to do that. For God's sake, we don't even understand how large language models learn. We don't even know what they know. All we know is, hey, we're figuring out different questions to ask it, and it seems to be able to answer them. But when you listen to Sam Altman, he's like, well, have we created um, you know, AGI? I don't know, he said. I don't think so. And Elon's like, well, it's three to five years away. It's unstoppable because of the profit motive. Mm. Well, also if, what you're talking about earlier with the need for increased productivity. But if you were to so map this on to the way that different geographies are responding to Bitcoin and crypto, which feel very similar to me uh, in terms right. of either you're embracing the new where things are going, you're willing to face that the way that we're handling the financial system creates these incentives. And so you're either trying to capital control, lock people in, not them, let them leave the country or certainly not let the capital leave the country. Or you're like, hey, you're using it as a way to get because people to come to you. This is a really important point, Tom. Why? Why do they want to stop you leaving? Because they want to mutualize the losses on you. Hmm. If you leave to the other place, they're not mutualizing the losses on you because your crypto hold. It's you know that's why the capital controls. It's like don't leave our old system. It's like exactly what's happening with the regional banks. Please don't take your deposits out because they all go bust. Mm. Our participation in the fiat currency system is our deposit, and if we go, you're just left with leverage because it's the collateral of the system. This is why. They don't want it to happen. And do you but, see, how do you see the US? Do you think that we're we're being, because it feels very antagonistic to crypto at the federal level. You're getting some stuff happening at the state so, level, which is interesting. So this is really important. So firstly, just on the AI versus crypto, very oppressive on crypto. The biggest AI companies in the world, the US. So they're probably going to be a bit softer touch around that. And these guys are playing the usual trick of, we'll be good guys. You don't need to regulate us. We'll kind of do the right thing, right? Because there's too much money available in this equation. So crypto US, because you know, the US, pro, uh, US citizens actually have a lot of capital restrictions. The land of the free is actually pretty unfree. People don't want to deal with US citizens in banks. So if you come to the Cayman Islands or the UK or Spain, and you're a US citizen, you want to open a bank account. Nobody wants to open your bank account, really. It's a pain because of the US reporting and the US tentacles, state tentacles, its grip on the global financial system. It, it owns swift payments, it owns everything, and it wants every US citizen to pay its taxes because the, the mother beast needs to feed the debt burden, right? So it's actually very restrictive. So it doesn't like you being able to opt out of the financial system. Okay, but then want to make sure they get the taxes it's fine you're, you're a citizen but different countries have been more loose on it i think europe is going to freak out over ai more than it the us is but europe's been actually better on crypto than the us has why i don't know but the crypto side of the equation is really important because i've lived this my entire life why is London such a big financial center, considering it's a tiny little island in the middle of a really brown, muddy, cold sea? It's because 
it speaks English and it has a well-developed financial system and legal rule of law. But what really changed for London was the US coming off the gold standard um, back in 1971-2, whatever it was. So that created something called the foreign exchange market because before everything was pegged to gold. Mm. And now the pound and the dollar and the Deutschmark and the yen were all moving around independently. And the US had capital controls because it's got the global reserve currency. It's like, please don't mess around. You know, we've just gone off and changed the global system. We need to be careful. Okay, I get it, fine. So the UK said, well, all of these people we trade with, they need to get access to different currencies now. So the foreign exchange market started, largest market the world had ever seen. Then the US made another false step. So the banks started moving to London, right? Big, lucrative, massive market deepened the UK's trade linkages with everybody, financial trade linkages. Next thing happens is now everybody's trading around with currencies. The dollar is the middle currency, the reserve currency. And people want to borrow dollars. And the US is being restricted with its capital. So the UK says, forget it, we'll do it. It became what's known as the euro dollar market, which is the overseas market for dollar borrowing and lending that becomes a we don't know the size of it but let's call it a 400 trillion dollar market <laughs> whoa and then the us then we get this big breakthrough in derivatives the us has got the chicago board of trade doing futures and options and all of this stuff but we start to figure out more complicated structures things like swaps and the US stops its banks doing it by its use of regulatory capital. They're like, no, 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 this is inefficient. You can't do this. The UK and Europe went, well, we're going to regulate and allow it to happen because it's big. We've seen this before. That becomes a quadrillion dollar market. Jesus. That's why every single bank from about 1985, well, particularly after the big bang in London. So let's call it from about 1990 to about 2008, 2010, all the major banks' largest operations were London. So Goldman Sachs' biggest operation, most profitable, London. Merrill Lynch, London. Well, Merrill Lynch is different because it was a brokerage firm. But JP Morgan, they were all London. So London, if you've been watching the news, is going to do the same thing. It's called regulatory arbitrage. London is putting together a very sensible set of crypto rules. As has Europe, as has Switzerland, as has Singapore, as has Hong Kong, as has Australia. Okay, there's its old trading group that it did with euro dollars and it did with derivatives and it did with foreign exchange, all got their regulations in place. The UK is the hub at the middle and it will capture the lion's share. And before you know it, Coinbase, Gemini and everybody will move to London. There'll still be listed firms in the US but they will move. And this is the issue with the AI and crypto. You can't shut it down mm. because if it is productive and it has value and it has future expected value that's higher than today, it will go somewhere. And if we look at the crypto market now, it's a trillion dollars. Okay, that's meaningful for the UK economy. Where is it going to go? Well, 10, 30, 50 trillion. Well, the UK wants that pie because it shot itself in the foot after Brexit. Um, so the US can try and regulate it all at once. It'll just move. It's like water. Decentralized networks and global fin finance and money is like water. It flows everywhere. And it's the same with this AI, which is why I don't think we can solve it with regulation. Mm. Because somebody's going to be have the profit but... motive. Yeah, it it will go somewhere. That is for sure. Walk me through the reversal, the Chinese reversal on uh, Bitcoin. So they had clamped down everywhere, including Hong Kong, but they've now opened up Hong Kong. That was startling to me. Well, they've done encouraging, this before, but they've done this several times before. Is at the wrong time they try and stop capital flight because everybody knows that the Chinese have been using this to get money out of the China economy, which is what. Stable coins are being used for as well, as has the global art market, as has there's a lot of things that the Chinese use to get money in and out of the system. 
So they try to stop that when the US dollar is very strong. That's a start because they can't lose control of their currency. It's a big fear of the Chinese. Additionally, the Chinese have moved towards a central bank digital currency, mm. which is very useful for them because once you, you do it, you can now take stock of the number of yuan in your system because there's no cash. There still is, but you know what you're doing is you can then see where it goes. Um, and so I think they did that. They got the size and scope of what their money supply really is. And now you can reopen it because you can now track it because it's all digital. Well, you couldn't track it easily before because you could hide it with bank payments, blah, blah, blah. But blockchain makes everything transparent, much to you know everybody's chagrin because everyone thought it was a privacy thing. It's actually not, not in that kind of mechanism. And I also think this is more contentious is that's the reason Binance survived everything, is the Chinese government wanted it to. Hmm. Because that is the linkage between the fiat world and the crypto world. And they own the you know, Chinese state, essentially, is a supporter of the largest crypto exchange in the world, because that is a potential bet on the future of the system of money. And it wants a say in that. And it makes total sense. Where is, where is Binance headquartered? There isn't one. Where does, oh God, what's his name? CZ, Dubai. Okay, I, yeah, I was going to say, I can't fathom that he's actually in China. Uh, very interesting. So when you think about, uh, um, sorry. And ahead. the US will probably support Coinbase in the end. What? Because everybody needs control of this situation. If not, the UK will take control of the entire money, the global world of new money. Or the, the yeah, digital look, I, system. I hope value. you're right about that, but I don't see a single move on behalf of the US government that would lead me to believe that uh unless they lose the Coinbase lawsuit, I, or, I think they're just gonna or we have a change of ahead. government. Yeah, true, true. Which is what do you think about 2024? I don't know. We haven't yet seen the contenders. You know, everybody's got a bit too much hair on them still, so we don't it doesn't feel like there's something obvious. But maybe there will be maybe something out of this. You know, I thought Frank Suarez, not because he's a um, Francis Suarez, not because, you know, he's the pro crypto guy. But he's, he's young. the mayor of Miami, right? He's the mayor of Miami. He is centrist, essentially. You know, he, he, it's just that kind of person, younger, more dynamic. We need to find somebody of that. We can't. The U.S. can't keep going down the same thing of baby boomers voting for baby boomers voting for baby boomers and trying to protect themselves. That has to be broken somehow. It has to be. It broke in the U.K. Look, Rishi Sunak, he's young. He's a centrist, young. Whether they keep him in or not, I, 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 don't, I, I, I don't vote in the U.K. anymore. But at least they're making progress, like crypto regulation and AI and technology and fintech and because they've got a young younger government. And we've seen that in, you know, France has done well because Macron is younger. Um, but, you know, so we need that. Yeah, that I will agree with. So since I'm wearing my, uh, my Doomer hat today, I'll push on the geographical thing. So what it feels like here in the U.S. is that things are really beginning to intentionally divide along geographical regions. And uh, you're getting like this hunkering down into blue state, red state. Uh, people peeling off. If you're into crypto, you're either going to Texas or you're going to Miami. Um, and seeing the, there's this whole new idea of uh, make America states again, where people are saying, hey, we need to stop doing all of the regulation at the federal level. We need to start pushing this down to the state level um, and letting the states compete for the residency effectively of the populace and let them begin to move. Now, I'm grateful as somebody that feels out of step with the federal government on my take on crypto. I'm certainly very excited that that is at least an option. But like your boy, um, Goldsmith, Goldweight, oh, James, James Goldsmith. There we go. Uh, I am. I would like to to broadcast my dire warning while there might be a, a 
part of that that is good, that ends so badly because you end up fracturing, you end up pitting people against each other. It ends up, I think, becoming very problematic very so fast. I saw this in 2012 um, because of what happened in Europe. And I saw what was happening in the US. It's one of the reasons I bought a, and built a house in the Cayman Islands. I just thought I need a plan B. And the plan B needs to be somewhere where nobody cares about. Mm, but I can still live a high quality of life. It was a very purposeful decision, knowing where the world was going to go because there was no solution. So the kind of realizations that you're having now, I had, it's <laughs> more visceral for you now because you're just seeing another banking crisis. But mm. we saw it in 2012. We saw really bad outcomes there. And I think the US one is still to grow. So it's just it's just the the delayed response of ha having it happen to you the moment it does it's like okay I get it now so i did this and i don't think that's going to go away i'm hoping for a miracle what doesn't go away sorry populism anger uh division and a separation into smaller states i actually spoke to um an old client of mine his old friend who's one of the world's great macro thinkers this italian counts and he speaks very quietly. And I was telling him about this. I was like, I think Spain is going to splinter into countries. The UK is probably going to splinter. Scotland will probably Whoa. separate, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he said, listen, Raoul, the trend of the last 50 years was super states, the EU, the United States of America. He said, usually those things end up separating again. And if you think he said, you know, he was a, whatever he was, a count from an Italian, you know, one of the Venetian states, these little small states. He said, the world does this, ebbs and flows, centralization, decentralization, right? It's, it's very common. He said, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's the getting there that could be troublesome. Depends how it, mm -hmm. how it happens. You know, don't forget, we disbanded the British Empire. You can reboot your life, your health, even your career, anything you want. All you need is discipline. I can teach you the tactics that I learned while growing a billion dollar business that will allow you to see your goals through. Whether you want better health, stronger relationships, a more successful career, any of that is possible with the mindset and business programs in Impact Theory University. Join the thousands of students who have already accomplished amazing things. Tap now for a free trial and get started today. That was gigantic. And yes, we, there was some pretty ugly stuff that happened, like, you know, the uh, what happened in India when, when we kind of gave back the keys and everybody killed each other in the partitioning. It was ugly, but it did happen over time. So I don't know. I think the trend is not going to go away unless we somehow change this economic equation because that's what's driving it. Yeah. It's the same equation that's driving it. Yeah, very, very distressing. And I think, unfortunately, I think the pieces are already on the table in terms of how we could potentially change the economic system, uh, which is effectively Bitcoin. You have to remove the ability to inflate. Once you take that away, though, there are also consequences on the other side. And so uh, it is a very, um, it's, oh, man, which, it's a very tricky Which is my, my, my argument has been, you can't do this at once. Anybody who does this wants the end of the world. It has to happen as a glide path. And over time, the crypto side of the equation, the new rails for the system, mm. can experiment, get itself sorted out, figured out, and then we can go. So my, I spoke to the, to the Department of Defense about this in 2014, 13, 13. And I said... You know, they periodically, you know, reach out to pe people like me, you know, thinkers about stuff who who are looking at crises and stuff like that because their job is to to assess risk. And I was talking to them about it and I said, obviously, he said, you know, we're worried about debt. We're worried about the system blowing up. I said, yes, obviously, everybody is. Because um, that's one of the things that need to game out. What happens if the West loses control of money and debt and everything else? And I said, well, I think the answer's there, and I think it's Bitcoin. And he said, yeah, well, tell me more. I said, and I think the US government and the UK government invented it, which is the NSA and the GCHQ in the UK, who are the two 
world centers of cryptography because even how the, the white paper's written it's, you it's think this transatlantic thing. yes I always have and I asked the Department of Defense they said yeah we've considered that too that they see think it was official or it was just people from that that went rogue I don't think it's a necessarily a rogueness I think like Google have like Google X where they do tons of experiments right they know that one of the esoteric risks for the entire Western system is the issue of money. So there's probably groups of people who are given things to try. And if you can seed a new system, maybe they tried a hundred of these and just one succeeded. We don't know. But it would make sense because that's what they do, this kind of stuff. So one of these took off. And so... I think it's always been. I don't think it's a coincidence it came out of the financial crisis. I don't think it's a coincidence that that the halving cycle and all of this is all related. It is the solution. It always, it always has been the solution. You just can't go there tomorrow. Mm. So all you need to do is let it happen slowly and manage that transition. You'll be okay. There'll be times where it speeds up because we've got something bad going on. And there's times when it slows down. But if you, and that's what I think the US government regulation is trying to do. They don't want to ban crypto, just slow this down. Because if all the deposits leave the banking system, it's game over. Mm. If they don't set up a way of collecting taxes because everybody's living in crypto land and they have to ask your honesty and what trades you've done, that's not going to work for them because they can't pay the bills. So, I think it's they're trying to catch up. Um, I think that the UK will have a CBDC. I think the Europeans will. It's all coming relatively soon, relatively soon, next five years, three years, four years. And they'll feel more in control of the system that they've got because they need to pay the interest payments. Because if not, and the the benefits, the aging benefits, you know, all of this social security is a problem with such an old population. People have talked about universal basic income, i.e. the government paying you because you've got no job, but the economy makes a lot of money because all the machines are doing it. And I just think what humans do really well is socialize. And you and I are big believers in community. And because of crypto, we can share the benefits of being in a network. So maybe that's the role of humans, that we can find new ways of working within communities to encourage communities, philosophies, like-minded interests where you participate in them um, because it's certainly not going to be doing anything that AI can do in 15 years time. It was pointless. It's really interesting, man. I mean, it's we so don't you... need Tom to make video. I mean, I was just had this today when I saw that model one and it's been in my head, but it's like us making video literally within two years, it's almost pointless, but within 15 years, it won't exist. You'll just put a prompt in saying, hey, can you get me to talk to Raoul about um, AI? Um, let's, let's, let's do it for about an hour and a half long, whatever it is. Off you go. And it does it. I've seen it because it's already happening. So you and I don't need to have a conversation because our AI personas can have that conversation. <laughs> is that what you predict? Because I don't think that's what will actually happen. I'm um, seeing it already. I'm seeing so here, here is, I think we have to ask the fundamental question, why did AI come into existence in the first place? Because I think that this is going to give us the most uh, direct understanding of the human condition so that we can predict where this goes. This is why originally I really wanted UBI to be the solution. It won't be. So I, I am the UBI experiment personified. So I made a ton of money, um, never need to work again, and yet work harder than I've ever worked in my life. And people that win the lottery end up imploding emotionally. Rich kids implode emotionally. There, there's a reason for this. And I would say it's a very predictable reason that tells us a lot about our future as it relates to AI. So there is going to be, and there already is, it's utterly fascinating. Uh, there is going to be digital influencers that are, they're not real people. Um, they're, you know, an avatar that you create and you feed it, you know, give me, uh, Rao Paul meets Joe Rogan and you go off and that becomes a personality and it does the thing. But the reason that AI exists is because nature had to make us face a saber tooth tiger to do that. It had to give us drives, hunger, uh, the drive for sex, all of that. And so 
it has evolution has embedded deeply in the human psyche a need for progress and a need for meaning and purpose a need for what you're calling socialization that the connection uh, with other people and unless we merge with machines which we will but it's going to be down the road that i don't see that coming barring a uh, massive acceleration of uh, technological advances aimed at the the uh, hardware wet work interface of the human mind, which may happen in the next 15 years. I would be a little surprised. Uh, uh, playing that clip might not age well, uh, but setting that aside for a second. So we have these biological impulses. They are incredibly strong drivers that force us to seek progress and contribution to the group. So as far as I can tell, one of two things is going to happen. Either the thing that really becomes popular is something I can feel a sense of ownership to. So I'll, I'll be blatant. There is a reason that I created an avatar engine because I'm getting older and there will come a day, unless somebody figures out anti-aging, where it's just not cool for me to be the guy on camera. So, hey, if I can create a visual persona that then allows me to be untethered to my physical body, which admittedly, it's beyond the scope of this interview to get into that. But I think there are actually things that have to be thought through very well there. I will point people to Jordan Peterson and his fears around virtualization. But anyway, if I can create a persona that allows me still to flex my intellectual muscle in a way that creates value in other people's lives, so I feel like I'm still contributing to the group, but I'm able to do it in a far more ageless way. But I need that sense of, I have not wasted my time on planet earth. And if people don't fucking hear me when I say, you better figure out a way for humans to feel that they have contributed meaningfully. And that is my, my huge fear. Giving them money is not going to solve that problem. UBI will not solve the problem of meaning. And so people have to figure out how does meaning exists in a world with AI. And you've got to realize here, the other important point is the AI doesn't care how you think. It doesn't give a shit about your emotions. But we it have to be thoughtful about, about that. It doesn't care about your job. It doesn't care about anything. It's so, going to. It, it, so think about it this way. AI, because I know where you're going. AI by default doesn't care about anything. But AI will do nothing unless you tell it to. So go get good at Go. Go win a video game. Go no, whatever. I, in the end, you see, the issue is, is where this goes is the AI has exactly the same state that you just described from humans, survival. Why? So, you would have to program it to care about survival. No, 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 no. It doesn't program. We're not talking about a computer program that reads this thing and does that. It's not a formula. This is intelligence you're building here. So intelligence yes. makes and builds on its own decision-making processes in ways that you cannot control. Agreed. So, but so here's where I think people are getting this wrong. People are forgetting humans have been programmed. And so people think, oh, this intelligence thing is devoid of context. False. If I fuck with your microbiome, I will mess with your ability, not, not even ability. I will change the way that you process inputs. So humans are so deeply contextual that I think people are delusional about what they think intelligence is. So my thing is intelligence is inert unless you give it an impulse. And so this is the fourth thing. So if number one is ignore, number two is uh, try to abolish, and number three is panic, and four is be thoughtful, the thing that we have to be thoughtful about, what are you going to what context are you going to create that creates that initial impulse of uh, context and drive for AI to do something? So Mo Gordat talks about this in his book. So the two books, I urge people to read them because look, there's a big debate about this stuff. Almost everybody ends up in the same place, which is Screaming kind of Screaming in terror? It's kind of like, yeah, probably we get replaced by different species now whether we're basically part of that, fatalism yes but whether we're part of that species or not is a different question right are we augmented or are we not so that's what homeless deus talks about and in great intellectual depth is augmented augmented humans or ex, um extermination of humans or replacement of humans by by another thing 
Mo Gordat says, I mean, you could palpably sense his fear because he saw it firsthand. And he just said, listen, it's all well and good now. We all kind of understand how fast this is moving and what this could mean. He's like, yeah, and we've also got, and we're working on Google is quantum computing. When you put these two together, you know, this is change. Because so you have one, sh- you have one thing, the only thing he thinks you can do to make this outcome that you're talking about is be nice. It's kind of this bizarre. To sim- AI or no, to each other? How we interact with AI and ourselves, that's what the AI learns from. So we're the parents of a kid that we don't know how the kid is going to grow up. So you can scream and shout in the household. You can beat each other up. You can do all of these things. You can shit talk about all these people and it's going to affect your child. Whoa. And so that was his point. And that was, it feels both naive, but also hopeful that there's a possibility. And the answer is how I've approached this is, look, we're not going to know. We can't know. We can sit here all day and talk about it. And there's thousands of pages of books and every sci-fi movie ever made is on this topic. So here we are at the Cambrian moment. Let's just fucking enjoy it. This is one of the most amazing things we will ever live through. And it's such an incredible change in how the world is around us. And we're all pissed off for the world around us. So here's something that's different. It's like crypto. Here's a new system. Here's another system. You know, how do we how do we deal with the issues of society? Well, we've got building blocks and they're interesting. Like our cars will soon drive ourselves and our Amazon delivery trucks will just come without people and they'll be running on electricity. And that electricity will have been generated by some super cheap power supply and a robot will have come and made your coffee. And, you know, just enjoy what's about to happen and embrace it. So if you can afford to, invest in it. If not, be curious. Because as you said, the first three points, there's nothing you can do. So you kind of go for the other human survival instinct, which is adapt or die, which is say, let's do it. And you say, well, you know, humans, we don't, we're not going to merge with the machines or whatever. As I mentioned to you before, we've all done it already. You've got no, your I think we will in. merge with the machines. No, I'm just you, saying timeline. You've got your earphones in. You've got your Apple Watch on. You've got your thing. You've got your glucose monitor. These are you merging with the machines. What are you doing? You're using the machine to augment your hearing experience, your health experience, everything. Everything around you is you using your uh, machines to augment yourself. And that is just going to accelerate. Because what is a pacemaker? but a foreign digital body implanted to give electric charges into my heart. Okay, if you told somebody that 100 years ago, do you think you're a scientific, a, a science fiction nutcase? But pacemakers have been going for, what, 50, 40, 50 years now? So the implants, the you know, people getting new knees, I mean, that's now like a quick operation in and out to have a new knee. And soon the knee will have electronics in. So it will happen without us even knowing. And you'll be doing a podcast in two years' time saying how you've had this new chip implant that's taking your blood glucose sugar measurements and beaming it straight to your phone, and then it prepares your meal exactly right. And you won't have even thought about it. But you and the machines are merging. Because... Do you know... Sorry, go ahead. Because to your point earlier, our job is to survive. And the single best answer for our survival is trying to get the stronger teammate. It's it's the only way. It's like, you know, you always want to choose the best guy on your team. Well, if we can merge with them, if they're part of our gang, we're okay. You're very high in trait openness, guaranteed, uh, as am I. It's interesting though. So I I think that the only uh, part of the solution to dealing with the current moment is fatalism, that what will be will be. And not that everything happens for a reason or anything like that, just that this is out of our control. 
And I, I think from the, the dawn of time, there was no way to stop the creation of artificial intelligence because technology is the promise of a better future. We have a, an insatiable, a literally insatiable desire for progress. Uh, we are going to inevitably create AI, I think on any timeline and on this timeline, it has already happened. Um, but I want to go back to what um, you were saying in terms of you're raising a kid and that kid is AI. That's very interesting to me in terms of how we think about it. I think that that's hugely important and was a blind spot that I had or was a, a metaphor that I didn't have in my arsenal. And that's going to be very, very helpful. I don't, in, in the same way that AI is inevitable, it is impossible for you to get the world to agree and be fine. And that's just a fantasy. It's I don't see how that ever plays out unless AI becomes so uh, domineering that it somehow forces us to, but even that is a dystopia unto itself. So anyway, I don't think that's going to happen. But the part that I think people are underappreciating is that you, people are anthropomorphizing AI. And I think that's a mistake. And I think that will cause them to be very surprised by how AI moves. And I think closes a door to a potential way to do this well. So what I mean by that is a AI does not care if it lives or dies. And so the moment people say, oh, well, AI wants to survive, that's an anthropomorphication. Uh, you're, you're thinking it thinks like a human and it doesn't. It is computer code that has not yet been shaped by an evolutionary-like force. We are that evolutionary type force. And right now, if you're correct, we are just sort of blindly saying, learn how we are. And I am sure everybody's heard the story of the AI that turned Nazi in like three days on the internet, uh, which is very troubling. Uh, and so I would say that just telling it, go learn how we are and regurgitate us back to us would be the wrong incentive structure. And there, there are many bright minds talking about alignment, but I think alignment is the conversation. And yes, it is, it is a very thorny problem. And for people that haven't heard that phrase before, you need to align AI's um, desires, quote unquote, with ours so that AI has the same goals that we have. And if you know Asimov, he wrote the three laws of robotics, which I don't have memorized, but basically the punchline was don't hurt humans. And so every robot was programmed with an inability to hurt humans. And so it was like, help a human whenever you can and never hurt them. And I forget what the other one was. So we need something akin to that with AI so that AI wants to be beneficial to humanity. Now, whether that goes back to the initial problem of once it proliferates, somebody's going to create AI that's evil, um, possibly. But I, I don't think in the same way that I don't think the the overwhelming level of intelligence that AI, AI will represent gives anybody the excuse to tune out, I don't think that the fact that someone will inevitably turn it into um, a very brutal weapon is an excuse not to try to create aligned incentives with AI. And so I think that in terms of the, the hopeful part, I think people need to recognize that AI doesn't intrinsically, intelligence doesn't intrinsically want to consume and take over and be in charge. That is a human result of evolution needing you to survive a ruthless environment that was truly red in tooth and claw. AI is not in that same boat and does not need to be in that same boat. And I agree. I'm not so sure about the anthropomorphizing it because, you know, we at core are some sort of program code of whatever it is. Whether there's more to that or not, you know, science is still arguing this stuff. But we've had computer viruses and their job is not to die. It's not that difficult. So I don't know about that. Um, there's a lot of unintended consequences that I hadn't realized because we're all having this debate, right? Is it going to take over humans or not? And I spoke to somebody at Google X and they're like, what we're worried about, I'm like, yeah, tell me, is like we're worried about how AI can be used for genetic modification and how yes. fast this is going to move. 
He's like, we're not worried about that stuff because everybody's worried about that stuff. But it is advancing so fast in human genome analysis and tinkering of genomes that he said, we're worried that you could just choose, I want to kill all brown-eyed people on Earth and create a virus that does it. So that is the problem with AI, is there are things that the computational power is so fast and so big that it can do a lot of things for science, which is amazing. For humans, you know, we will we will use AI to probably cure most forms of cancer or figure out, you know, part of the, the secret code to life, longevity, health, all of these things, amazing. But we will also use it to destroy ourselves because we're humans. And that's what they're worried about because it's so prolific that it's actually not that difficult. There was a very funny and the who, whatever brilliant Twitter user this was, my apologies for not paying attention. I didn't know it was going to stick with me as much, but somebody put in the comments regarding our just inability to stop developing AI. They said, great filter, go burr. And uh, for people that don't know what the great filter is, it's like, why are there no aliens trying to contact us? And the one potential punchline is that there's a great filter, could be AI, could be thermonuclear war, but that yeah, just nobody can get past it. And so every society goes so far and then stops. Here's another interesting idea along that, which God, so for people that know Graham Hancock, who just really believes that there was a, an ancient civilization far older than we think. Uh, and that it it got obliterated. This was the Fingerprints of the Prince Gods book. Finger well, he's written a bunch of books on this, oh, but right. the, the most recent thing was called Ancient Apocalypse. So he's been writing about it for, I don't know, 30 years or something. His books are fascinating. Uh, and he, he, so plants that initial seed. And then I, again, I don't know who said this. This was relayed to me by one of my employees who was pulling wisdom from Twitter. Uh, and he said, it is entirely possible that AI really is the uh, great filter go burr and that we have developed AI before. And every time we get to the point where AI takes over, much like in the matrix, we end up uh, relying on something in, in that movie, they black in the sky. But in reality, if, if technology rises, AI robots take over, it could be a massive solar flare that ends up then just obliterating AI and all the technology. And then we come up as a civilization worshiping a sun god again. Because it was like, you killed the fucking machines. Thank you. Uh, and I thought, oh my God, like probably not true. But the other one I thought is, about ooh. is if you are this super amazing civilization somewhere in the far ends of the solar system, not in the solar system of wherever, of no nothingness, and you figured this out. So what you would do is you figure out that organically you have to let something grow because this nice kind of, Organic computer is much better at adaptation up to a point. So why would you not seed a billion planets and one or two happen? I mean, and and one or two spring life. They'll all be different, but they'll all end up, to your point before, in a AI and machinery. And maybe those things turn organic eventually because organic, but with that kind of augmentation... So maybe we are that. Maybe we were just planted. Maybe the bacteria that started the Earth were just planted on a billion planets and ours happened to be one of them by this amazing group of whatever somewhere else. Who the hell knows, right? But yeah. Okay, so before we move on, because there's a whole other thing I want to get into, um, I do want to wrap this up with a bit of hope. So thinking about this a lot, I think that there is, so you said something, uh, I can't remember if you said it to me or somebody else, I've seen so much of your content, uh, but you said that that we're, that we're going to go through a renaissance. And I think this ties into what you were just saying, which is, guys, what, what we're about to live through, maybe it's 10 years, maybe it's 100 years, but we're, we're going to have a moment where you're going to be able to utilize this to massively extend your own capabilities. The impossible now, is possible. The, the impossible, impossible is possible. Is possible. Um, imagine that. We've all grown up with superhero films. We've been given it. It's amazing. Yeah, this is going to be, I think, uh, 
It it already is. So right now, if I can just get hyphy for a second. So at Impact Theory, we're we're a media company. So we're trying to improve the world through ideas and entertainment. And they're two separate sides of the company. On the idea side, that's, you know, we've been talking a lot about that. AI is going to help you think through things. It's going to help you see around corners. It's going to find um, signal and noise patterns that we wouldn't otherwise be able to put together. But it it also, so, Raul, I can't tell you, I, I have honestly lamented three things in my life. Lament is the right word. I have lamented my limited intelligence. I have lamented my inability to sing. And I have lamented my inability to draw. And those are things that would make my life better. I'm a very excitable person. So take that, you know, with a grain of salt. But I, we're using AI to help us create Project Kaizen, which for people that don't know, don't worry about it. It's, it is a new form of video game. And I am limited my contributions are limited by my ability to extract from my head the the vision, the literal visuals, and make them a thing. And so there was a part of the experience that I was like, okay, we, we have to move on. We have to keep going. But it just wasn't good. And it didn't give me the visceral response I wanted to feel when I saw it. And then mid-journey comes along. And I'm like, oh, I I can actually now create the thing that's in my head. I can use text to go this, this is what I've been trying to tell you. And then no joke, three days later, we, we, it, it's just so much better. It's unbelievable. Now we still had humans had to go in and you basically use it as art direction, but all that frustration that I had of like, not, I'm not feeling what I want to feel. And I'm not talented enough to translate the emotion into words to get an artist to create the thing. But through prompt engineering, I could. And so finally I could go, this, this is what I've been trying to say. That That is, it felt like a superpower. It was one of the three things that I have, in fact, I've never put this together like this. One of the three things that I have lamented to a God I don't technically believe in, I have lamented about not being able to draw, just to really make it simplistic. And I can now. And I understand why that makes artists mad, but at the same time, this is amazing. And for people that lament that they don't have my verbal ability, you now can. It's really, and because I'm not a person that gets overly defensive about somebody else getting good at my thing, uh, I'm just excited. It, it really is as close to superhero abilities as we're going to get. Have you seen the music version? So one of my lamentations is, I love music. I just can't make it. I can't play guitar, can't sing, can't do anything. But I know in my head what I want to create music from. And already, again, the Stability AI people have got a music version. I think Google have got one as well now coming out, where you can kind of say, listen, I want that kind of deep funk bass, but I want to have X like this. And this, same as you just did, is you're getting at your word vomit of how you're visualizing it. And it will make it. So there's hope for us yet, Tom. It'll trade. Well, actually, auto tune. It could even yeah, say you. true, true, true. That's, that's humans being augmented by machines. Because you look forward as a yeah. macro guy, and you have to like try to make some sense of this. I know it's to be true that the only answer to a debt laden aging population is what I refer to as more cowbell stimulus. Stimulus is the status quo. That's why you like Bitcoin, because you can sense that stimulus is the status quo, the debasement of currency. It's the only way. Because G if GDP growth doesn't grow as fast as debt growth, your income is not covering your payments, right? That's It's as simple as that. And the only way of juicing GDP growth in that formula is debt. So debt needs to grow. The economy needs to grow fast enough that it pays it off. But now each unit of debt lowers the, the uh, each unit of debt gives you less GDP than it did. So it's now $3 of debt gives you $1 of GDP growth. And it's been going like this. Okay, so if that is the construct within which we live, the truth, 
then at some point, if I look at the future and say, I'm going to live in nine months in the future, is the central bank raising interest rates? There's almost a zero chance. Really? Well, because we've already got to the tipping point where inflation is starting to fall. Mm. Just the extrapolation of interest rates mean that they will be below the Fed funds rate by about March or April next year. Mm. So therefore, and what, the Fed going to go to, what, 10%? What's left? Rubble. People rioting in the streets, right? You can't do it. So you've got to the point, you're getting close to the point where the rate of change changes. And in six to nine months' time, the Fed are likely to have stopped and probably cut because stimulus is the only way the world works. So they raise rates just to lower them again. Correct. So they lower the rate of inflation, but then it's like, oh, shit, we need to bring up GDP growth because if not, we all go bust. Right. And we need asset prices to rise because you can't let the collateral go bust. That's what's just happened in crypto. The collateral the FTT token, the Luna token, all this stuff went bust. End of game. All the leverage gets blown up. So they can't allow that. So stimulus does, is, comes. Is, does that work in the same way? So what happened for people that don't know what happened with uh, FTX, there were people that wanted to sell their FTT and get their money out and they couldn't. And so they just paused, sorry, or whatever you had on their exchange because they were off gambling it. So you wanted to get that back. You couldn't because they had used it somewhere else. Now, I'm assuming that we have that same problem of the government always has to be able to buy the people that want to cash out. Is that the issue? No, it's even a bigger issue than that, Tom. If you borrow money to buy a house and the value of your house goes down 50%, you're insolvent. Only if I want to sell, though. If I don't um, need to sell, I'm fine. Yes. That negative equity means that the banks then become massively proactive in not doing any more lending. That was 2008. The collateral went down. Mm -hmm. So where, what else do we borrow against? We borrow against our future, our jobs. I.e. you go to the bank or you use a credit card. It's because you've got income, right? You lose that. That's your asset, your income that you generate, right? You can't borrow money. The whole system blows up. You can't pay any of your other debts. If you're, if the, in the stock market, in the financial markets, people borrow against bonds and they borrow against st stocks and they borrow against all sorts of other elements of wealth. If those things go down too much, then people stop asking for their money back because the, the collateral doesn't cover the loan. Mm. And that's the issue that the society faces. So it's at every level here. Um, it can't happen. So if your share price goes down too much, you probably can't borrow money if you're a public company because people then worry, can you pay them back? If your income goes down, all of this stuff. So therefore, I think that, as I said, this is how the world works is stimulus now in this particular phase of the world. And therefore, looking out nine months, the probability is, knowing what we know about debt and demographics, that the central bank has not only stopped raising rates, but is probably easing rates to try and balance out, as you talked about, this is what you want them to do, right? You want them to try and just stop the worst part of the collapse and the worst part of the boom. So they'll be doing that. The probability is, is that they will also be trying to inject money into the economy because there's no velocity of money because these old people. So that's quantitative easing. What does that do? Asset prices go up again. So all roads lead to asset prices going up over time. It's a trick because it's a, they're devaluing the value of the currency. It's a trick. But then you've got, you've taken the bet and I've taken the bet, which is like, we well, we like crypto because we think it not only offsets this whole mechanism because it's a fixed asset, but it also is a technology that we think unlocks a whole bunch of other opportunities and therefore it's valuable. So that becomes a superior bet and I can't get to a more superior bet and I've tried and I've gone through everything. I just wrote huge, long 160 page article about all of this in Global Macro Investor. And I still can't get to a position where in this construct of the world, that Bitcoin, Ethereum just, just don't become even more and more dominant and valuable. How much do you think that it's because those sorry, Tom, just to go just to clarify that for people, one of the reasons it's so valuable is like what you're doing. 
you're building this whole kind of NFT, metaverse projects all involved in blockchain, right? You're building an applications layer on top of the of the ecosystem, whether it's Ethereum or whatever you're using, right? But basically, you've realized that you want to build in this ecosystem that's making Ethereum or whatever you're doing more valuable. And so it goes on. Yeah, and I, that's one of those things that, uh, especially right now, there's real opportunity for builders for sure. I'm actually really glad. I'm heartbroken for all the people that have lost, but I'm very glad that in my corner of the blockchain world that the gamblers and the people that were just there for the money have been wiped out. It no longer feels like a sound investment for them, which is good because it shouldn't be treated like an investment. It should be treated like you would treat uh, an interaction with Disney, right? It should be emotion-based. It should be connection with the IP. Anyway, so that is very interesting. But even I, like I'm ultimately, I'm chain agnostic. So right now we're building on Ethereum. So I wonder, is it Bitcoin or is it something that mimics digital gold? Is it Ethereum or is it some other thing that has the and, same kind of properties, but better and, adoption? You know, I don't know and I don't care is the answer. Like you Because not... you'll move as you see it happening. Yeah, I'm agnostic too. You know, just because I think that ETH has the superior benefits because you're building on ETH and we at Real Vision are building our NFT community on ETH. Now, whether you use Polygon in the middle or not, doesn't really matter. But, you know, I see people doing it on Solana. Okay, that's interesting. There's not a lot of people doing it on some chains and Bitcoin. Nobody's doing it on at all because you can't because no smart contracts at scale. But Bitcoin has its other value proposition. That's cool too. But um, yeah, I'm I'm agnostic. But, you know, our game, I want to manifest my future self. My game is to back the right horse, which is what you're exactly doing with your Bitcoin bet. Is you're saying, you know what, this probably adds to my real estate and the businesses that I'm building and will help me deliver to myself my promises. Now, what do you think about what Zuckerberg is doing with Meta? Do you think that's just insane, the amount of cash flow that he's pouring into it? Or do you have a different take? He didn't have a choice. Human interaction is going into the metaverse. What that means to different people is different things, but it's going to be a more immersive, 3D-like experience. It doesn't have to be VR, could be AR, could be even just more 3D render, uh, browser rendering kind of stuff. That ability to interact with humans in this new very digital age, I mean, this is a very 2D experience for us. And if there was a way that was a little more 3D, and we can have people gathered around us listening in the same room and we could see their faces um, or their PFPs. Okay, it feels more human. Even though it sounds non-human, it's actually more humanistic. I think he realized that, that you are going to adapt or die. So he has to go through the S-curve moment and take the big bet. I think he'll pull it off. What does that mean? Because people, again, immediately jump to this dystopian black mirror, Mark Zuckerberg owns this whole metaverse world. It's not. You know, you and I will have probably calls like this, maybe in his version of the metaverse or another one. And it, it's like you use one email server, I use another. I, I don't know what you use. I don't really care. You, know, you might use Gmail and I use Outlook. Mm. You know, it's we will just use whatever is suitable and they will make tools that are going to work really well for large corporations, people at scale, people in third world countries that don't get access. And so I think the probability of success for him is, is high. And I think the market is mispricing that probability because what they've done is taken cash flow out now to invest in the future later. And the investors are like, I don't know if this is going to work. Amazon went through the same when they did AWS. Everyone's like, what the fuck are you doing? You're doing cloud server when you, you're a retailer. And they're like, not really. You know, we think there's a big opportunity and they were right. So um, Apple's doing the same bet with AR. We just don't see it yet. But they've been plowing money into it. And Google have been doing this forever with AI. You know, they've all played, they're all taking a different path for this exponential age and placing their bets at scale. Um, because if not, they're out of the game. Yeah, I agree with that. What will be very interesting to see is given sentiment, given going back to what you said at the beginning of the episode, that... You've never seen a sentiment like this. 
and seeing how negative people are on crypto. When FTX blew up, I was like, oh my God, like this is really, like sentiment was already bad, but this is really gonna get people just screaming that this is all a scam and all that. And I was like, okay, as a builder, I just keep coming back to my thesis on what the technology allows me to do. And every time I look at that, I'm like, part of me is excited that so few people believe in it because I'm just going to keep going, keep building. And as long as we can cross the chasm, because you need to find ways to invite people into that world. And if they're like, you know, so averse to it that you can't even get them to look at you, you have a problem. I think that will be short term measured in call it three to five years, but long term. I agree that I think that this is where people are going. It is the most logical outcome, knowing what I know about humans and what the technology is going to be able to do. And watching Mark navigate this will be really interesting because he's getting pummeled by Wall Street. They don't like what he's doing. He's lost a tremendous amount of value, but he has voting control. So it's a question of, is he going to stay that course and keep building? And as somebody building in that same space, I am so grateful for what he's doing. And I don't understand other people in the space. I mean, I suppose it's what you're saying about they're worried about a Black Mirror version of the world where, Look, you know, some big... Tom, there's a really it. noticeable thing. And I see it because I was the macro guy who was always looking for the downside because I just make money out of it. And I changed my, my, my thesis based on what I was seeing in technology and and all of these things, and this is probably the solution. And what I got back was a response that I did not expect, which was anger. Mm. Not debate, not, yeah, I'm not sure if you're right, anger. And it took me by surprise. And I realized that change is happening too fast. And it's happening too fast for the investors in Facebook. They can't assess it. So they either turn... They, you either do what we're doing, which is like, we're just going to embrace it. We're just going to move forwards. Let's see where this crazy journey goes. And others look back and go, I want those white picket fences and my Mustang with 18 liter Mustang. And I want that because I can't deal with this. They are angry because their American dream, again, it's the psychology of human self, has been shattered. They're still saying, my future is lies ahead. But so if, remember we talked about at the peak and at the bottom, humans over-extrapolate mm. with emotion. I'm now totally bust. I'm now, I'm the richest man in the world. And so this societal change is doing the same thing. And people just think this is the end of the society that they understood, the American dream that they were given, and they don't want anything to do with it. And the rest of us are going, actually, maybe that's a new exciting place. And I could both make money out of it and enjoy it and go along for the ride and see that. And that is played out in Twitter all day, every day. But it's it's an amazing emotional anger that I think is based on around a mentality of a fixed pie versus a growing pie, an infinite pie. And those of us who have started to look forward are now firm believers in the pie is probably infinite, depending how you address it. Yeah, talk to me more about that. I have a guess that this is going to go back to what you were saying about robotics and AI and that you're getting more energy or more GDP out of uh, each kilojoule, or I forget the exact way that you said it. Okay, so let me let me go through this, the fixed versus the, the growth mentality. The fixed mentality is, if you dare use another source of energy, you're going to rob us of the fossil fuel jobs and stuff that we have. And that is bad. Mm. As opposed to, oh, well, if it evolves, we can probably get more energy than we, you know, per kilo, we can get more kilojoules out of a unit of energy if we don't use fossil fuels. That's probably net big for society because you could build more stuff and do more stuff with it. The fixed mindset is no. You can't replace fossil fuel with solar. It doesn't work. The equation doesn't work. And I'm like, you don't have to replace it all. We can have both. But if it's not such a large part and we can create cheaper or more efficient energy elsewhere, net, net, the pie grows. Is it? I mean, the central banks don't like, like to see their pie changing and their pie is, well, there's crypto. It's a whole new system of money. So no, 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 our pie was this. You can't just come in with this new pie. And we have. 
That's exactly what's happened. Yeah, 2022 feels like the rate of change has really accelerated. And I've started telling people, hey, plant the flag in your mind. 2022 was a year that AI became really usable and like a day-to-day -day person's life. Have you seen the interview I did with Emad Mostak no. on Real Vision? Tell me more. Oh my God, it's the, uh, probably the best interview I've ever done. Um, he's an old mate of mine who was a global macro investor, subscriber, hedge fund manager, macro guy. He had done some other stuff and he's been on Real Vision a few times in his old guys. I saw him on Twitter talking about AI. So I'm like, what the fuck are you up to? Come and talk to me on Real Vision. And then he releases, he'd been kind of private what he was doing. And he's just built Stability Diffusion and Stability AI, which is the large and source open AI projects in the entire world. Because I've seen some of the uses of that. It's crazy. So he compressed every image that ever existed on the internet down to a two gigabyte file. What? And he's doing it with music. He's doing it with video. He's doing it with the written word. So OpenAI is one of them. Google has got their other version, DeepMind, and his is the open source version, which is terrifying because it means it's unstoppable. But it's it's mind blowing. So you've got to watch the interview because, like you, I kind of thought I had a handle on how fast this is moving. My whole interview What's is me his going first. Emad E M A D, Mostak M O S T A Q U E. He's a Brit hedge fund manager, not the guy you'd imagine is going to do this. He's just raised his first $100 million round. He's only been going for two years, Tom. Wow. He so... built his own supercomputer. And he wasn't the richest dude in the world. He was just an ordinary guy uh, in two years. And even Sergey Brin and everybody went to his launch and everyone's jaws to the floor saying, holy shit, this has just changed everything. Mm. Yeah, so obviously I follow what people are using AI and media for. We've actually started using it here at Impact Theory to amazing results. And I've started seeing people showing, oh, we're using stable diffusion. Here's what we got. But I didn't even know what stable diffusion was. I didn't know. I knew it was AI, but that's all I know about it. And the results are astonishing. And as a creative, what it lets you do, dude, when I think back even 10 years, let alone 20 years, Bro, when I was in film school, we edited on Steenbex. It was a gigantic metal contraption that you cut like with uh, basically scissors and taped it back together. Like I'm not that old. So the fact that we've come that far to now seeing people do stuff with stable diffusion and turn literally instantly turn like a person moving into an animated cartoon, it's unbelievable. So as a creative, I love it. And that's so two, years, point about the Renaissance. two years old, Tom. He's like, we barely started. And what he did, the clip trick that he did that the others didn't do, the others all went, this is too powerful a technology. We're not going to give it out to everybody. So we'll mm. give bits of it out like GPT-3. And he's like, it's too powerful a technology not to give it to everybody. So then you've got 10,000 people building already on top of what he's built. So it's just going to be like a virus now. It's just going to explode. Wow. And now... To think through that one is we are, I'm, this is what I've been begging on Twitter, we are in urgent need for digital ID, blockchain-driven digital ID, because this interview can be done with, by AI. It just ingests all of your interviews, all of my interviews, and say, hey, get Tom and Ral to talk about Dude. societal collapse or whatever it is, right? I've already you, seen, did I've, you hear the Rogan and Steve yeah. Jobs interview? I mean, look, it's obviously early days, but... How well they captured the vocality, especially of Rogan, where when he would be like trailing off, the AI would trail off. Now, my only beef with AI in its current inception is that they always feel like they're about to make a point, but they never quite make the point. But I mean, if that's where we're at now, where are we going to be in 20 years? It'll be insane. Insane. And so think of societal stress when you don't know a single thing, what is true and what is not, mm. right? And that is not happening in five years time or 10 years time. That's happening next year. You know, GPT-4 comes out next year and GPT-3 is so powerful anyway. I hate to think what GPT-4 is like. So nothing we read, nothing we watch, nothing we hear 
is verified from its source of truth any longer. So we so urgently need a system of authentication. So anything that appears with you will have the token that I can mm. scan or do whatever, check in my browser to know, yes, this is authentic Tom, or this is AI Tom, and maybe you've got your own AI Tom, and that's okay, but you need to know what's authentic Tom and what's AI Tom. In two years' yeah. time, we're going to break society unless we do this, because we oh. need to go through the elections in the United States with AI. Dude, so this to your point, the other day, Lisa came over, my wife, and I was showing her my TikTok feed. And I was like, hey, do you think this guy's attractive? And she's like, yeah. And I, he was probably like 25, something like that. And I said, would you believe me if I said that he was 35 years old? And she's looking closely and she's like, I guess. And I said, would you believe me if I said, that's not a human, that's AI? And she was like, what? She had no idea. She's looking right at him, trying to like judge his age and had no idea. He's not real. And this was a video, man. It wasn't even a still. It was a video of him speaking. And she didn't realize that it was AI. I was like, oh, my God. Like, this is, yeah, to your point, we're going to need something to authenticate. And also, it's just as, again, somebody that builds a media company, the thought of being able to create characters where I can, like, give them backstory, motivation, all that. And then another character, backstory, motivation, all that. And then put them together. And they will react in a way that surprises me. Now it's like you can get into creating these very rich, surprising experiences. Yeah, but you know where that leads to, right? You give a character a backstory and it lives. Now, of course, it, right now we're not at the point where it's conscious, but it lives enough that it writes its own story. Yeah. And all the characters write their stories. Where does that story go? We don't know. We've already seen that Microsoft AI that they tried to put on Twitter and it became a Nazi within a week. <laughs> and they were like, oh dear, we need to stop. So it's just, it's, it's fascinating, right? So what you're creating now literally could have a life of its own. Yeah. I mean, look, as a writer, that's always the fantasy. Now, do I want them to become conscious beings? I don't know about that. But for them to be able to surprise me, that would be I mean, that dude. That yeah, but what if amazing. they get their own followers? They don't have to be conscious. They just have to be AI. Mm. And they have their own followers and they start developing a political opinion based on their interaction with followers. And before you know it, they're, they've now got a million followers. They're more powerful than Tom and they're now trying to influence elections. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. That's, I mean, so I, it I sounds, think enough, it sounds crazy, but it's, it's going to happen, right? It will. You'll be able to put guardrails in. And so this is where now, of course, some people aren't going to, and they're going to have AI exactly. that goes bananas 100%. Exactly. There's no doubt. And there are going to be some people that like that they're AI. So it's not even like, oh, well, people know it's AI and they will ignore them. No, they won't. So for sure, there's no doubt. But to the double edged side of that sword, as a creative, somebody thinking about making immersive worlds, it, it, I, I am now completely in your camp. I've never thought about it as a renaissance, but you're absolutely right. Before this all, the counter peg explodes, it's going to be pretty amazing. So here's another thing for you. is My strong belief is that Elon Musk did not buy Twitter because he wants to own social media. Once you see AI, you cannot unsee it. Once you see the robots, you cannot unsee them. Mm. So he has built cars with self-driving AI, right? And it's still obviously developing, but it's developing fast. He then is developing the Optimus robot. Yet again, everyone's saying, it's never going to happen. Of course it's going to happen. How Whether many things he... does a guy have to do before people go, wow, he's really capable of pulling things and, off? And even if he doesn't do it, somebody else will. So what is the next step, right? Your character that you're building, your characters, right? How do you give them personality? The biggest way of having a robot that can make you tea or do whatever, or you send to Mars and it can be building a civilization in Mars, is by feeding it Twitter. Mm. Because you've got all of humanity losing its mind, loving, hating, scamming, all of humanity's there. And then the next thing he says is, what I'd love to do is add video. Well, because TikTok has been doing this. They've been scraping the AI for the Chinese state, so it appears for facial recognition and human understanding and AI tools. And the other thing he talked about was, I'd love to get long form content. 
We like all of those things, video, long form content, short form. What he gets is all elements of humanity to train AI from. I'd pay, if you were the richest man in the world and you're building AI and you're building robots and you're building all this stuff, would you pay 44 billion for the largest proprietary data pool in the world, should you want it? If you know how to monetize it, for sure. Well, so and I think robots. he's he's going to go even farther than that. He's, I mean, this is one of those when people tell you what they're doing, it's probably best to believe them, especially when they have a track record like that. He's, I'm going to create the ultimate payment platform. I'm going to make the WeChat of the West, and if he can pull that off, it becomes so much bigger than what it's been thus far. It'll be very interesting to watch this happen. And also the um, the, the other thing is that he has just fired, got rid of about 90% of the staff. Yeah. People don't realize, I can see people saying, well, well, Twitter won't be here tomorrow. It's not like Twitter is people peddling behind the scenes. <laughs> it's technology. It actually doesn't need the humans to run it on a day-to-day -day basis, apart from to fix a few bugs, but it's, it's not like it bugs every day. Mm. So he gets to rebuild it. To hear more about Ray Dalio's warning on the upcoming recession, which we're almost certainly already in, Watch the full episode here. Talk to me about the three forces that you see that are influencing this moment. We've got banks collapsing, U.S. dollars under attack, uh, looming recession. What 